Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. How's everyone doing? Post lunch, we're awake. Everyone has coffee, you got a little sunshine. I know we, we saw a tweet earlier today that even the Norwegian delegation was cold in this room. So hopefully we now have a little bit more warmth and we are glad to see everyone back with us today. My name is Kathy Feingold. I'm the international director at the AFL-CIO, also the deputy president of the ITUC. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all back today for this conversation on global shocks. As we heard today in the forum, we are all facing a convergence of crises. We are still not fully recovered from the global pandemic that puts to test both our health systems and the labor market. And we heard today also, we are in the midst of a climate crisis. Many of you just came from the COP in Egypt. And workers are also in the crossfires of persisting and escalating conflict. We also heard this morning that so many people are um, facing attacks on worker rights and the closing of democratic spaces in our countries. And of course, growing social and economic inequality. These are a lot of crises. On top of that, we're experiencing a global energy crisis as well as food shortages. And rapidly increasing inflation is leading to a major erosion of workers' real wages and increased economic insecurity. That is a lot to think about. But what we do know is it is up to all of us to be on the front lines to address these crises, to make sure that we address them in a way that is good for working people and the environment. So in the first part of this forum today, we'll look at how unions from across the world are actually responding, driving their governments to preserve and create quality jobs ensure decent wages, and extend social protection in the midst of all of these challenges. We are not going to accept from our governments that because we're in a time of crisis, they can't invest in working people. We heard that before during the 2008 crisis, and this time we know it needs to be different. And that's why we have with us today so many people that are gonna share with us their experiences of how they are working to safeguard workers' livelihoods and build resilience against future shocks. So today we'll have three rounds of exchange. First, we're gonna start with what we heard from Sharon Burrow today. The main priority we have is what? Jobs, jobs, jobs. If that's one thing that Sharon Burrow is gonna leave, leave us with is the focus we must have on jobs. From there, um, we will go uh, to the issue of wages, and we will hear from our colleagues of how they are addressing um, wages, and then we will hear about social protection. And then we will open up for a discussion to hear from all of you, because I know many of you also have um, exciting uh, strategies for dealing with these crises in your country. So we're gonna jump right in here, and I'm gonna sit back at the table and start the conversation. So I am now going to start um, and call on the first three speakers to discuss exactly how did you address the key priority for job preservation and job creation. I'm going to first turn to my brother from Kosatu, Mike Shingage, first deputy president of Kosatu from South Africa. Mike, investment in jobs I know is a major priority for Kosatu. I know that you're working for an inclusive economic recovery from the pandemic. Can you tell us about your key demands and how the government is taking them up? We can actually, I think the microphones are on, is that correct? Over to you. No, no thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of the session. Indeed, uh, it's common cause that the COVID-19 crisis has severely impacted on the employment around the world, particularly the hardest hit sectors among certain groups, including women and youth. And as COSATO, we believe that job creation and the inclusive growth must be the epicenter of any recovery strategy in South Africa. And in our country, in 2020 alone, we closed off with a bleak labor market 
with over 2 million jobs that have been lost and many factories having been closed. We have thus put food funds to our government to try and preserve jobs. And the first demand we have put as COSATO, we, 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 we said that we need sector specific uh, strategies that are geared towards the restructure, the economy towards more equitable job creation and growth. Of course, we are aware that this is a long term process, but we believe that uh, the effective interventions must be geared consistently and systematically towards the new growth path. The second demand we've put is that these sector strategies need to ensure that the economic sector protects the current job and create more sustainable jobs. And a critical task is to identify industries that are mostly relatively labor intensive and that are sustainable and are able to grow the substantial for the foreseeable future. And this sector is to considerable state support to make sure that the growth and achieve equitable outcomes. We have also called for the critical structural changes to the industrial policy that focuses on substantial ex expansion in the agriculture and food processing for both the domestic and regional market to ensure that decent work and better equity in the sector and the major land reforms and agrarian development is there. And we're also calling for the creation and the support of cooperatives by the indigenous communities. To this end, together with our government, we have forced the African government to introduce what we call the economic reconstruction and the recovery plan. The plan which was set to unlock and create jobs and fast track the recovery process of the economy. And this is based on the social compact of both business, government, and labor. It's a, it's a compact of social partners in the, in, the, in the country. And this also a force that the government must ensure that the big companies, including the government departments, must do what we call buy local. In other words, must support the industries that they are producing, for instance, tools at home, so that we can preserve the jobs, but also create more jobs. So every government department, instead of importing goods, every company, instead of importing goods, we have said that they must make sure that they buy from the factories that were affected by COVID-19, uh, so that we preserve the local jobs and also create even more jobs. And we're saying that to sum it up, the state must absolutely prioritize sustainable employment creation in all the core of the current plans that we have, which combined economic development with an expansion in decent work, because we don't just want a creation of job, but we want a job that is sustainable and decent. And moreover, the state must have a structure that can drive development through a combination of discipline and the resourcing for a current plan. That's some of the interventions that we are, we are asking from our government. And lastly, we want to say that we know that what is discussed by business and governments, what is called the new economy and the new world of work, is something that's going to exclude the working class. And that's why we're calling for the workers to be included in the decision making about what's supposed to be a new world order and a new economy. Because otherwise, is going to perpetuate the discrimination and the exclusion of the majority of the poor in the economic cover. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much. So many things happening. Yes, thank you. So many things happening in South Africa. I love the idea around the procurement strategies to save jobs, making sure government is, is buying locally decent work, not just any old job, but jobs with rights and protections that are sustainable. The fact that you have this compact, a social contract, great ideas um, for how uh, COSATU is shaping a resilient uh, strategy. I'm, we're gonna go from South Africa to Belgium. Uh, Miranda Ullens, General Secretary of the FGDB of Belgium. Miranda, can you tell us a bit about how jobs were impacted in Belgium during the COVID-19 pandemic and what measures the Belgian government took following pressure from all of you, the trade unions, to safeguard workers' jobs and livelihoods? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Well, in the COVID crisis, um, 
we had a, a, a specific situation. We were not as heavily impacted as other countries on the loss of jobs because uh, only 4% of households recorded job loss. A quarter of the families were confronted with a change in working conditions, but the impact was less severe than in many other countries. And um, specific groups in society, however, were more severely hit by the crisis than other. We saw immediately the people who needed to, to continue to work but in difficult situations and got sick because of that. Uh, we saw the people who got sick and who went out of a job, but we had a social security system that's quite unique uh, uh, to um, avoid, avoid that people lost their jobs. And there were, were a lot of people who were uh, uh, working at home. Uh, people who work in the public sector as in the private sector, as in the private sector. But we saw, however, that young people had less opportunity to get into the labor market. That's the difficulty. They don't have the real good contracts uh, to have a good job. And the, the, the impact for the women was double. They are overrepresented in sectors that were highly affected, and especially in the care sector. They had to cope extra work also in their own household because the schools were closed. So they needed to take care of the children and take care of the job. Or So it was quite difficult. And we saw that there was an impact on uh, the gap between the, the poor and the rich, uh, like I think in all over the world. We managed to protect the jobs due to our extended social security system. I know it's, it's in the third panel, but it's a particular system I would like to explain anyway, because we have a temporary unemployment system. So that means that when the social security, when the people didn't have the work, but they maintained their jobs, it was a social security system that is financed by the working people and by the, the employers uh, to have the, the benefit of the un unemployment. And we make sure, thanks to social dialogue, we make sure that, the, that those benefits, if the people got sick or if the people got out of, a, out of work, that the benefits got a, a bit higher because it was really difficult to make two ends meet. More than at the height of the crisis, more than a million workers were using this system in the private sector. In the public sector, uh, they they had the, the the work at home, or they they went out on on the floor. But there were uh, companies in the private sector who were forced to close, and workers who uh, were forced to stay at home or work at a distance. So the the system prevented massive layoffs, um, and we were the gatekeepers of. Uh, the protection for the people. We went out to negotiate uh, good, healthy conditions at all the levels, on the confederation level and in the federations. We went out to negotiate uh, the fact that people had more uh, unemployment uh, allocations, and we went out to, to, to negotiate better working conditions if they, the people worked at home. But we saw that the government, who luckily was with a left-wing political party since uh, the end of 2020. So they helped us a little bit, but the problem was they gave a lot of public finances to the employers too. And after the COVID crisis, we saw the, benef the benefits raised, was really increased, and then they created jobs. But they only created jobs not with wage increases. That's the second panel, so I, don't, I'll, I won't go into it. But it, it was really a, a bit of a strange effect. And now they're saying, but we don't have enough people. They just should, should pay them more. And they just, just should give them better working conditions. Because after COVID crisis, what's been a fact too is that there was a lot of mental stress and a lot of uh, stress that people needed to go and continue work on the working place. And so people fell in burnout uh, and, and they really need less working time. So we are really pleading for a collective uh, um, decrease of working time. That's what we are trying to do. And respect more uh, the salaries uh, of the working people, of course. Um, we had the, the, the opportunity to negotiate a bonus, but it was a real, a real little one. And the most important is that when government had helped the enterprises with public money, there should be a return on investment on the public to invest in the public services, 
and in the wages of the people. And I think I'm out of time. Perfect. And I think you, you end on a great point that that, thank you, yes. <laughs> to invest in good jobs, take, that, take those resources that came because of the pandemic and make sure that it wasn't just any old job, but that it was an investment in a good job. We're going to cross the Atlantic again and come to Canada um, because during the pandemic, there was a heightened awareness about the need to invest in the care infrastructure. And I know the ITUC just um, uh, published a report, if you haven't seen it, on the care economy, which I highly recommend. But in Canada, um, under Vicki Smallman's leadership as the Director of Women's and, and Human Rights, um, you've been thinking a lot about the care economy. So we know that investment in the care economy has been a long-standing demand of the Canadian Labour um, Congress, but during the pandemic, one-third of working mothers considered leaving the labour market because childcare just was not available. Then in 2020, the Canadian government announced the establishment of a national childcare system with an investment of $30 billion billion, that's incredible, over five years, with the aim of removing barriers for women to remain in the labor market and also creating new quality jobs. Can you say something about the CLC's role in this landmark policy? Vicki, I have a feeling you had a lot to do with it. Over to you. Yeah, we, I, I mean, I will say that this is not something that just came out of thin air. And when you're talking about building care infrastructure, you really have to play the long game. Uh, CLC or the Canada's uh, Can Canadian Union activism on child care goes back many decades, uh, five decades in fact, maybe even before, but in 1970 there was a Royal Commission on the Status of Women which recommended the establishment of a national child care system. Uh, and so five decades and many, many campaigns later we are finally seeing some concrete steps towards making this happen. Um, so I want to highlight a couple of campaigns that I think really helped to pave the way for this decision that the government made uh, uh, during the pandemic. Um, one is the Rethink Child Care campaign. And uh, this was a campaign that we launched in the lead up to the 2015 federal election, a couple of years before. We really wanted to make child care a vote determining issue in the election, uh, but we knew that we needed to change the conversation. Uh, to get people to start to think about childcare not as just the problem of an individual family or an individual mother who needs to go to work, but really as something that we all depend on, you know, to, uh, to benefit the economy as a whole. Um, and we wanted to get people thinking about it differently. So uh, we also wanted the labor movement to embrace childcare, um, uh, you know, as, a, as an issue, as a key issue you know, in the lead up to the, the, the federal election, it was so that it's not just the domain of the women's committee, but really to understand that because childcare is so fundamental to a strong economy, we all should be taking this on as a movement. It should be central, uh, central demand of our movement going forward. And then of course, we wanted to make childcare a vote determining issue in the election. And one of the tools that we developed to do that was called a kitchen table conversation kit. I mean, we really went back to the grassroots for this and we set up structured, a structured conversations to get people to just share their stories with each other. Their stories about looking for childcare, you know, of trying to pay for childcare, all of the ways in which our patchwork system was failing parents. And what we found is that everybody has a childcare story, everybody. Even if you don't have kids, maybe you have a colleague that, you know, can't find childcare and you got to cover them. Or you have an adult child who's pressuring you to retire uh, so that they can, you can take care of their kid. Uh, and this really helped to get buy-in, really, to make childcare a significant um, priority. And in fact, I think we were successful because during the election, three out of the four political parties had commitments to childcare, and we did elect a government that had made such a commitment. Of course, then we needed to hold them to account for this promise, right? Um, uh, now, one very important strength in our childcare um, movement, and that childcare movement is far beyond um, labor. We have a lot of allies uh, who are in the non-unionized childcare sort of sector, um, uh, experts, academics, feminists, and so on. And we have a really well-developed consensus, a common vision for the system that we wanted to build. And the vision gave us the roadmap uh, for our advocacy ahead. We, and, and a new government meant that we had the right people at the right tables at the right time 
to make a difference. Now, little did we know that it would take a global p pandemic to actually create the conditions for the, for the government to follow through on its promises, right? We had, and I won't have time to tell you about our done waiting campaign, but that was also in the lead up, uh, you know, after the election to really sort of say to the government, you know, you you say you're feminist government, now it's time to put your money where your mouth is. You need to walk the talk um, and follow through. And so uh, childcare was a key demand of that. Now with the pandemic, obviously, we suddenly had unusual suspects really coming on board, clamoring, demanding childcare because so many women and and others had to leave the workforce. Suddenly they were at home, schools were closed, childcare were closed. It was a massive uh, pressure and it really created a, a very broad consensus and the momentum to make this happen. Now, of course, with the government's announcement, it is absolutely not over. We have a very complex political system <laughs> in the way that uh, public services are delivered. Childcare is the domain of the provinces and territories. Many of those governments are conservative. So while they have agreements with the federal government to get money to sort of build this childcare system, um, it doesn't mean necessarily that the childcare system that they build is going to be the one that we'd like to see. What we need at the core is a very strong workforce strategy. We need decent work for childcare workers because there is no quality childcare without decent work for childcare workers. We need to make sure that the system stays in the public domain and it is not in the realm of for-profit multinational corporations. So the struggle is not over and that's where we are now. Fantastic, thank you. We need some of that coming over the border towards the United States. We would love to have that. And I, I'm taking note of your kitchen table conversation kit. I'm guessing more people might be interested in having those conversations as well. And I think you really underscore, Vicki, the importance of not only do we shape the policy, but it's not over once we have the policy, we need to shape the effective implementation of that policy. So that's critical. So thank you for underscoring that. So. Now um, we've heard some great examples and we're gonna talk about wages. And I know it's hard to kind of divide this all up because jobs goes with wages, goes with social protections. We want it all. But we're gonna turn to um, wages. We know how wages have been stagnating across the world over the last decades. And minimum wages in many places, including my own country, are dismally low and inadequate in ensuring decent livelihoods for workers and their families. And as we're currently experiencing a cost of living crisis, the imperative of raising wages becomes more urgent than ever. So we wanna now hear some examples from other unions who've been working to secure a much needed pay rise for workers, both through strengthening minimum wage laws as well as expanding collective bargaining. Plamen, I'm gonna turn over to you, president of the CITUB of Bulgaria. Raising minimum wages to the level of a living wage is a central objective of your union's work. Can you say something about how the union's, your, your union strategy to secure a pay rise for Bulgarian workers and how you have yielded real results? Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Katia. Uh, of course, I can say it a lot, but uh, I have to limit myself in a five minutes time. And uh, let's start with uh, saying after good afternoon for everyone. And uh, just to remind ourselves why we're here. Uh, we are here to fight for the new social contract uh, and new social contract mean decent work and social justice uh, for all, social justice coalition as the new DG in the ILO just proposed. And um, two main components of this, uh, of this uh, new uh, social contract uh, that we fight for is the labor protection flow and social protection. I'm not going to speak of social protection, but going to speak about the labor protection flow and mainly uh, the main component of so labor protection flow which is actually decent jobs uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, living wage, minimum living wage and living wages and, uh, and, and more, more general, uh, together with the freedom of uh, association and collective bargaining, of course, otherwise we cannot achieve uh, those uh, at all. Am I happy to uh, remind ourselves that this June, together with Evelyn and the other guys uh, in the ILC, uh, we finally got uh, uh, ILO uh, ready to work on the research and on the definition of the living wages. After one, more than 100 years, uh, declared in a constitution, but also in a Philadelphia a declaration, the living wage should be something that sh should follow, should be, sorry, should be uh, achieved uh, for every worker and his uh, or her family. Finally, we've got uh, that this is gonna be happen, I hope, within uh, 
uh, you know, um, months time, and then uh, uh, the concept of the living wage would be much more clear. Because now we have uh, a national and regional concept about the living wages, uh, but not necessarily uh, something that is much more clear, even for us among the union movement. And for I in my organization, we are trying to, uh, to fight for this uh, since uh, many years uh, uh, we are observing uh, the coupling of the productivity and wage growth uh, and also declining, uh, declining labor share. And uh, all, all this stuff should be fixed up uh, with a collective bargaining power, but also with the definitions and the real targets that should be uh, measured towards the adequacy uh, of the cost of living uh, for uh, a worker and uh, 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 his or her family. And uh, together with uh, uh, Maximum Hours' work, this is the old labor protection floor that we have to fight for. And uh, I really want to share with you some uh, experience with in my organization, but one more to say. Second point that is very important for me, uh, when you fight for the living wage, when you fight for the fair wages, we should come to the something which is much more important, uh, at least in, from my region in Eastern Europe, but also in the other part of the regions in the world, uh, where the, f the wages and the produced value added is not sharing fairly. And I'm speaking about the global supply chains, my friends. And global supply chains equal pay for the work of the same value along the global supply chain. It's not only the gender issue. It's not only the gender dimension of this fight that we're having for many years, but now this is an additional dimension that we should address very clearly with a global supply chain, hopefully a law convention, or at least kind of uh, standard setting uh, uh, documents from the ILO, but also the trans-border collective bargaining on fair share value added uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, pressing multinationals uh, uh, headquarters and uh, bargaining uh, together with uh, headquarters trade unions, usually is not uh, um, easy to achieve, as they're sitting next to me and know what is happening in, in Europe, but at least we're going to fight for this. We're going to fight for this, I promise you, and it, during this Congress, next Congress is uh, uh, after five years or 10 years time, we're gonna achieve this for sure, that the role uh, of uh, the national, uh, the union centers, but branch unions, but also the GAFs should uh, very uh, clearly uh, increase in fighting in vertical inequalities. This is the key issue, vertical inequalities, not only horizontal. We have fighting against discriminations, uh, which is very fair, uh, gender, migrants, or only other vulnerable uh, situations in the labor market, but the vertical inequalities, what are we gonna get, in fact, is that really fair? Uh, I think it should be put in the heart of our, our job. And what has happened now in the ILO, which is another threat. Uh, employers are threatening uh, very clearly uh, collective bargaining, not only right to strike. And without collective bargaining, we cannot achieve fair share of the wages. It is very clear. So we have to fight in, a, in, a, in, in Geneva, uh, firstly to defend uh, that the workers is every worker, not only the employee, and collective bargaining is ap applicable for every worker, including the informal workers and the other guys. A very few words about, about uh, uh, our experience. C2P is calculating uh, uh, cost of living since uh, 1990. And we have our methodology for uh, one workers, uh, single worker family, and three wo member household with a two worker family and uh, one child. And of course, we're gonna further develop this living wage methodology uh, for the bipartite and tripartite negotiations. We are fighting for national living wage alliance, uh, covering the local authorities, NGOs, scientifics, uh, and uh, some multinationals which are keen to join, and even single companies. And on top of that, we are gonna benefit from the directive. I'm not gonna uh, go to the directive, European directive on uh, minimum, uh, uh, adequate minimum living wages, adequate minimum wages, sorry, it's not living, for <laughs> speedy to say. And uh, of course, collective bargaining, uh, strengthening and John uh, finish with the figures. Uh, if we are uh, gonna achieve this, this target that we have from the 1st of January now, uh, adequacy tests of minimum wage in my country uh, should be uh, eight, 890, almost $900 uh, per month. Uh, and this will be really good to have it in our, in our pocket. And I stop here, thank you very much. Thank you, Mohamed. And thanks, thanks for reminding us that collective bargaining is at the heart of all of this, at getting a true living wage. And you have set up the next person so perfectly next to you, Esther Lynch, to continue to talk about uh, the Deputy General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, to continue to talk about um, the importance of, of minimum wages. Esther, the EU recently agreed on a minimum wage directive for establishing and raising minimum wages as well as extending collective bargaining. 
Can you tell us why this directive is so greatly needed for workers in Europe, especially during a time of rising inflation? Thanks, uh, thanks, Kathy, and good afternoon uh, to all of two. The, um, the, the, this session is about shocks and dealing with shocks. And one of the major consequences of the last shocks that had to be dealt with in Europe, the financial crisis, was we noticed that there was a, a deliberate policy to reduce statutory minimum wages and to remove collective bargaining, importantly, the extension mechanisms and multi-employer uh, bargaining. And we learnt that lesson well from the past. And we used our time in the past four years to try and put in place sufficient shields against those types of policies being pursued against workers and their unions ever again within the European Union. And that was important because the EU, the ECB and the IMF were all part of the same troika who turned up. I know in my hometown of Dublin in Ireland, they turned up very clearly um, and uh, reduced the minimum wages and the extension mechanisms for multi employer and sector agreements. And that was why we really worked hard, unions throughout Europe, to secure this directive. Now, a directive is a law that applies to all uh, European uh, countries, all EU member state countries. And what it requires them to do is to make sure that they're not competing on the basis of low pay or on the basis of keeping unions out of the workplace. It says very clearly that all member states that have a statutory minimum wage must ensure that the statutory minimum wage is adequate. And then it gives some guidelines of what adequate might mean. And I really want to thank the work of the ITUC and Eva, and I know Plamen has been leading this as well within the ITUC, because we took your recommendations for 60% of the medium wage and 50% of the average as our trade union threshold of decency below which nobody should be required to do work. And we put that within the directive. But more, we look to say that's only the first step of check-in adequacy. You need to make sure that the minimum wage is a living minimum wage. And just by way of example, because I know um, uh, uh, there's, this, there's this popular opinion promoted by many European governments and employers in Europe that everything is wonderful in the EU for workers. Nothing could be further from the truth. Two in ten workers on minimum wages. And what does that mean for a minimum wage worker, for example, in the Czech Republic? They have to work 60 days. 60 days is taken up just to be able to afford their electricity. The human rights standard says on a minimum wage, on a living minimum wage, you should only have to work 20 days. That's how much things um, are very serious um, within the, the minimum wage situation in Ireland. So we're really looking forward to this directive kicking in and making sure that, uh, that, that, that no government is pursuing a strategy of trying to be competitive with its neighbour by having uh, low statutory minimum wages. But that's the part that's about blocking that low road cutthroat competition approach. We also made sure to include in the directive the decent work approach, the high road approach, which recognizes that the only way to get um, a wage that's fair is to have it collectively bargained through your trade union. That's why the directive also says that any country in Europe, in the EU, that has less than 80% of workers covered by a collective agreement has to put in place an action plan to promote the right to collective bargaining and to increase the number of workers covered by a collective agreement. It needs to do that in consultation with trade unions and employers, the social partners. And there's two important measures that have to be part of that action plan. The first is to say 
within public procurement, so if the state is paying for something, it needs to make sure that that money only goes to companies that properly respect the right to collective bargaining, and we're going to need all the help of the ITUC to secure the ILO conventions because the directive deliberately refers to those conventions. And secondly, it says that uh, governments must make sure that there is no interference in the right to collective bargaining. And we really hope that that measure is going to prevent the type of union busting techniques that I know all of you have to deal with on a daily basis. So back to you, Kathy. Thanks so much. And you looked at me when you said union busting. Uh, the US knows a lot about that. And so I think to hear about this important directive is so important to put a floor under workers. Again, I'm hearing both from Kosatu and your presentation the strategy around procurement, which I wanted to highlight again, and obviously collective bargaining as being so fundamental. Brother Ayuba, we are now heading to Nigeria to hear about your important campaign. Uh, as president of the uh, National uh, Nigerian Labor Congress in Nigeria, the NLC recently managed to achieve a landmark increase to the minimum wage. Can you tell us a little bit about your fight to raise wages for workers in Nigeria and campaign to ensure not only that you win it, but you effectively implement that raise? Over to you. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, good evening, colleagues. Well, to start with, uh, cost of living have continued to sour due to inflation, and uh, basically it has resulted in making many workers uh, to work in precarious condition, and uh, in fact, we refer to them as pool of the working poor, because many families are working, but they cannot be able to... Many workers are working, but they cannot be able to take care of their families, uh, and that necessitated actually the demand for the review of the national minimum wage. Uh, minimum wage, as we are aware, protects workers against undue low pay, especially in rural uh, agriculture and also in informal setting, uh, of which in my country they constitute about 60%. So if you leave all of this out of the minimum wage basket, it then means that you have a pool of the working poor. Uh, we are aware that uh, employers and government in crisis, crisis situation have actually used the crisis situation as an excuse not to review minimum wage or even freeze wages. And in many countries, they have given that excuse that, well, because of the crisis, it's not possible to review wages. And in most cases, they will propose actually uh, wage uh, freezing process. But we fought tooth and nail. And uh, basically, Nigeria have ratified uh, Convention 26 on uh, uh, minimum wage fixing mechanism, which entails that uh, the process for fixing the minimum wage uh, have been adopted and uh, we have also uh, domesticated it. But at each minimum wage review process, it has always been a, a struggle that workers have to wage because employers would always resist uh, even when it is provided in our laws. Uh, so the minimum wage was actually due since 2015, uh, but because of the crisis, government said, well, and employers that, well, they cannot be able to review. Uh, so we have to issue a notice to say that, well, the minimum wage is due, uh, the purchasing power of workers have been reduced to virtually uh, nothing, and we have to pro proceed on an industrial action. And in our own case, because the minimum wage law is actually set by the central government, it's a federation, but once it is set by the federal government, it means no employer of labor can pay below the minimum wage. But employers in public, private, and even in the informal sector, all employers of labor must then pay the minimum wage. That is the provision of our law. And the procedure is also that once the process is set, it will be a process of collective bargaining and dialogue. Uh, so the process was set after a strike action, which was called off after the dialogue process was then set by government. We then dialogue, and it took us about one year, because most of the employers and government were not actually negotiating in good faith. So that led to a lot of delay. And even within the negotiation process, we had to actually issue uh, threat to say that, well, if the negotiation is not proceeding and you are not negotiating in good faith, then we can then revert back to our strike action. That is how we got a collective bargaining agreement. And after the collective bargaining agreement, it has to also go to parliament because in our own case, it has to be enacted for all the subnational government and private employers actually to implement. So it's one leg to get a collective bargaining agreement. It's another leg actually to get implementation too. So we were lucky 
we got the collective agree agreement signed. And the second leg of the struggle is to take it then to parliament. And we took it to parliament and we deployed four strategies. The first strategy is actually lobbying. We went to every member of parliament to lobby, to say this is about workers, it's about your constituency, it's also about making sure that workers don't work in a situation that they are poor. The second issue is about putting pressure. We also left open our uh, 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 decision to continue to go on strike if the issue is not resolved. And the third one is campaigns. We are on the streets. In fact, every week we are on the street in every province, in every state, and also nationally, protesting and putting the issue on the agenda of our politicians to take it serious. So in all, we're able to get the law enacted, and then we went to the next level, which is implementation. Uh, federal government was first to implement because our minimum wage is not only about minimum. Once you set the minimum wage, there is also what we call consequential adjustment, which means every salary will also be adjusted because once you adjust the minimum, it then means that other uh, components of the salary will also have to be adjusted. So we negotiated also the consequential adjustment, adjustment because once we set the minimum wage, uh, from, we move it from uh, 18,000 to 30,000, and then we then negotiated the consequential adjustment, which is uh, in percentage. The consequential adjustment after the minimum wage is set is also in percentage across salary levels in all the sectors. And therefore, it is very huge. That is how we're able to negotiate and implement. Uh, the federal government started. Uh, employers in the organized private sector also signed in. And uh, where we had challenge was the subnational government. Uh, the subnational governments, we then have to engage them one after the other uh, to make sure that the minimum wage is implemented and to make sure that it's also being paid. Uh, so basically, this is how the struggle for the minimum wage uh, was achieved. And uh, importantly, is the fact that we have never got a minimum wage on the platter of gold or any wage review on the platter of gold. It has always been through the collective struggle of workers. From 1981, when we first enacted the first minimum wage law, it has always been through collective struggle. And in most cases, it has to actually result in strike and protest before we achieve a minimum wage because it is huge because of the consequential adjustment. So I can say emphatically that we're able to achieve that because we deploy workers' power and because all of us were on the same page to say that, well, you cannot use the crisis as an excuse because even within the mix of the crisis, what will address the crisis and also bring about peace and social justice is if workers are able to take care of their family. And that is the slogan that we have used to say that workers are not slaves. Workers also have families. They need to take care of their families, and therefore they need a better day. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you did it. You, you brought in the the most important ingredient, I think, which is collective action and worker power. All of these stories have that in common. Without worker power, without collective action, without advocacy and mobilization, none of these wins can happen. So thank you so much, Brother Yuba, for sharing the experience of Nigeria. So we've heard about jobs, we've heard about wages, and now we're gonna talk about that floor that we're all trying to build. And again, we've heard different pieces of it already, but I wanna turn to the issue of social protection. We all know how social protection is such a critical measure in helping workers cope with shocks, such as job loss or sickness, as well as dealing with other life transitions like maternity and retirement. It's also key to just transition. If workers don't have a floor under them, you cannot make the transition uh, to good jobs in the green economy. So this is an incredibly important um, piece of our work. But nevertheless, nevertheless, what we saw during the pandemic, over half of the world's population lack access to any form of social protection. And social protection systems have faced harmful cutbacks in some countries in recent years due to austerity. And in many countries, there are economic models that meant corporations didn't pay taxes, didn't help governments build out social protection um, systems. So I would like to now give the floor to two people who will speak about what their unions are doing to defend and extend social protection in their countries. David Acuna, Presidente of the CUT Chile, uh, is going to speak first. The new Chilean government, I think many of us have been following what's happening in Chile has proposed to reverse the privatization of pensions in Chile, as privatization had led to inadequate benefits and high levels of inequalities. 
Coote has been a long-standing critic of pension privatization and has called for public, universal social protection system. David, can you explain your key demands to the new Chilean government and why these are so urgently needed now? Sí, mucha, muchas gracias. Eh, se han tocado distintos temas acá que tienen relación completamente con lo que estamos acá hoy día, la, el tema del mundo del trabajo, desde cómo protegemos directamente el empleo, a cómo fortalecemos también los ingresos mínimos para que pueda también eh, alcanzar, no solamente eh, trabajar para vivir o para sobrevivir, sino que también que nos permita alcanzar el bienestar en las familias. Uno de los planteamientos que nosotros tenemos en Chile es la alta desigualdad en torno a las pensiones o lo que es el sistema eh, de, de, de jubilación en Chile. Eh, bueno, vas a saber que Chile sufrió una dictadura en el año 73, con lo cual efectivamente nos impusieron un sistema eh, de pensiones el cual vino a de, vulnerar completamente eh, todo el sistema de protección social. En Chile se violaron eh, derechos humanos para quitar los, violes, los derechos sociales. Entonces, ahí es donde estamos hoy en esta, en esta construcción. Eh, Chile tiene un sistema de pensiones el cual eh, habla mucho de la capitalización individual. Plantea, se plantea del torno a, al 10% de cotización, lo cual debiera haber entregado en algún momento el 100% de la última remuneración del trabajador. Eso eh, no ocurrió, no ocurrió y no va a ocurrir nunca. La capitalización individual en Chile ha fracasado. Lo que se está planteando hoy es un sistema mixto, como en muchos de los países europeos o de la OCDE, los cuales tienen pilares contributivos. Nosotros hoy estamos abriéndonos a poder generar eh, un sistema el cual nos permita eh, generar con el aporte también de los trabajadores en conjunto con el aporte de los empleadores y el rol, el rol que también tiene que jugar el Estado. Hoy solamente con dar un dato, eh, si en Chile no existiera el aporte del Estado que fue entregado en el gobierno de la presidenta Michelle Bachelet a través de la creación de un fondo solidario, eh, los, lo, las pensiones estarían muy, muy por debajo de la línea de la pobreza extrema, que en Chile son cerca de 138 dólares. Entonces, con la, con la implementación de este pilar, eh, efectivamente pudieron llegar a un promedio de 193 dólares eh, la pensión mínima que se recibe en Chile o la pensión media. Entonces, con el sistema que se está proponiendo hoy, eh, nos podrían permitir eh, llegar a, a generar pensiones por sobre la línea de la pobreza o por sobre el ingreso mínimo. En Chile el ingreso mínimo era de 350 dólares aproximadamente, eh, los cuales eh, en este último periodo eh, como Central Unitaria de Trabajadores de Chile negociamos con el gobierno del presidente Boric, lo cual nos permitió llegar a 400 dólares. Entonces hemos planteado de que efectivamente al término del gobierno del presidente eh, pueda llegar también a superar la línea de la pobreza eh, para una familia de cuatro personas que en Chile es alrededor de 550 o sobre 500 dólares. Nosotros esperamos poder también llegar a esas metas para poder efectivamente eh, seguir entregando eh, una, una mejor calidad de vida también a, a la y los trabajadores. Entonces, eh, también el sistema de seguridad social o el, las pensiones en Chile vulneran altamente los derechos de las mujeres. Aquí se hablaba del trabajo de cuidados. Eh, efectivamente, la mujer en Chile paga todos los costos en torno a lo que es la seguridad social. Su tasa de comparativa en torno a las pensiones son eh, completamente diferentes a las del hombre. El hombre tiene mayores beneficios, al contrario que, la, que las mujeres. Entonces, esa discriminación también estamos buscando poder eh, mejorar y que no, es, exista, no exista efectivamente. Eh, en Chile lo que estamos buscando es un nuevo pacto social. Con los derechos sociales son el centro también de este cambio. Entonces, eh, para nosotros es muy importante eh, generar lo que es el colectivismo. El individualismo se ha ido apoderando, lamentablemente, de mucha, del pensamiento de muchos trabajadores. 
Lo, el modelo neoliberal ha fomentado efectivamente esto. Esperamos y creemos que necesitamos eh, fortalecer la organización sindical, necesitamos fortalecer el rol de lo colectivo, necesitamos fortalecer cada vez más el sindicalismo que es tan necesario. Entonces, efectivamente, hoy estas discusiones nos permiten seguir trabajando, seguir fortaleciendo, porque muchas de las cosas que aquí se han comentado nos pasan en muchos países y tenemos que buscar la solución en conjunto para poder llegar a este gran pacto social. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, David, and thank you for bringing uh, back the reality of needing collectivism, really, and collective power, again, to build that social protection floor and to have a different vision for the economic model that we need. So from Chile, we're going to go to Cambodia. Um, Brother Ton from the CLC of Cambodia. The COVID-19 pandemic really revealed the urgency of extending social protection in your country, in Cambodia as workers lost their jobs and livelihoods. Can you say something about what the CLC union in Cambodia has been doing to promote further extensions to social protection? Yes, thank, thank you, uh, Cathy. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anton from Cambodia. I think this uh, topic is very important for the, the worker, especially the uh, worker around the world who are working in the informal worker. In our uh, country in Cambodia, before 1990, uh, 2019, we have no the uh, law of the coverage of the social protection in all sectors, just only the, inf uh, the formal sector. And we, are our union, we have uh, demand a lot to uh, have the, the new law. In 2019, the law of social protection is adopted to cover all of the workers in Cambodia, including formal, informal, and also the uh, 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 public sector. But this one now is just in the paper, it's not uh, implemented yet, it, especially the informal worker has not in cover, especially the who are work in the uh, agriculture sector, construction, and also farmer, and all, so who are work uh, based uh, daily worker. And we have, uh, we, uh, we also uh, know that uh, among the our uh, 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 Cambodia uh, workers, just only 2.7 million of the, them are covered of the social protection who are mostly in the private sector and also public sector, but not in informal. Among the, the our population is on 1.6 million, so it's uh, just on only around 30 percent of the uh, of the, the people are coverage. And of course, uh, during the uh, pandemic around this, uh, Cambodia, have uh, affected and also the more of the sector, especially tourism and uh, garment, and also other sector are affected. Yes, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, labor abuse, uh, dismissal, and other uh, 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 fires job uh, uh, from a worker without uh, pay compensation. It's more of the uh, worker is just uh, allowed to lay off without pay and uh, without uh, any uh, uh, proper uh, to uh, support them during that, that time. I think uh, uh, that also the government has uh, not allowed the deputy solution to set up in this period of time, and also the union activity and other is very restricted. And also uh, the uh, government uh, cut off some of the public holiday, especially the uh, seven day of the public ho holiday in the uh, calendar of the holiday. And also uh, government have a, a have some part of that, but it's not uh, really uh, uh, many, just uh, only the few people who are working in the government sector and uh, tourism that have some part, but more of the worker in the country is not uh, have the any assistance from the government. And you know, the uh, informal worker in Cambodia is 60% uh, of the total workforce. It's mostly our work in uh, farm farmer area and also the uh, 
deliver and including the who are working for more secure self employed this one is facing a lot that they have no in us uh, uh, money and any assistance from a government to support during they have the problem especially during a pandemic and now we we have uh, do some work to uh, uh, have worker especially we demand and we got ring and we propose to the government to have the worker and also we uh, work together with the uh, other uh, trade union and, and our other constitution to push the government to uh, create or issue the administrative order to implement the, the, the new law of the social protection to cover all the workers, especially the workers who are work in the, uh, the area of the uh, dangerous place, and including informal worker and also the agriculture worker in the whole country. So in general, we have a lot of the challenge and we have no uh, enough uh, energy or something to respond with that. And we are the unions not uh, powerful to do the, the this appropriate because a lot of restriction, is especially the new law of the COVID is established during that time to restrict the uh, worker right and also the uh, human right uh, uh, to uh, protect or to demand something. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for also bringing into the conversation the importance of extending social protection to the informal economy, which is obviously critical and one of the big reasons there are so many workers without a single social protection. So we've talked about jobs, we've talked about wages, and we've talked about social protection, and we can really see how it all goes together, the need for collective power, the need for collective bargaining to really shape policies and make sure they're effectively implemented. Finally, before we open it up to all of you, let's turn to the role of the international community and its role in supporting an inclusive global economic recovery. As you know, all of us have been calling on effective implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, as well as greater support from international financial institutions for quality jobs, decent, decent wages, and social protection. And as many of you also know, unions at both the international and national levels have long been calling for increased official development assistance for social protection, as well as a global social protection fund to mobilize and coordinate financing for the world's poorest countries. With all of this in mind, we welcome the recent uh, initiative from the UN to establish a global accelerator on jobs and social protection for just transitions. We will now play a video message from Ms. Shahara Razavi, Director of Social Protection at the ILO, who's going to explain the Global Accelerator and why the international level coordination on jobs and social protection is so greatly needed now. You can play the video, please. While climate change, demographic transitions, and technological transformations were already compounding the difficulties that many countries were facing, in eradicating poverty and reducing inequalities, the COVID-19 pandemic made matters worse, of course, by decimating jobs and livelihoods and exacerbating income insecurity for billions of people around the world. The impact has been particularly acute for the 53% of the global population without access to any form of social protection benefit, including those who are working in the informal and the care economies. To make matters worse, over the past months, fragilities in the global food and energy systems have triggered a cost of living crisis. Labor incomes and social protection benefits have lost their purchasing power, adding to popular discontent and social tensions. Now, in this context, middle and low income countries that are constrained by rising debt burdens and shrinking fiscal space are facing an even more daunting policy landscape. This is the context that calls for a renewed collective effort to tackle the root causes and structural constraints to better manage and eventually exit these crises, ensure that the benefits of globalization are more equally shared, both within and across countries, and also address these looming structural economic changes that are on the horizon. Conscious of the fact that today's crises demand a comprehensive and coordinated response, the Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transitions, which was launched by the UN Secretary General in September 2021, is a UN-wide and multi-partner response 
to support countries to accelerate their reforms through its three interrelated components. First, integrated policies and strategies to overcome decent work deficits and facilitate just transitions. Second, increased investments in decent jobs and social protection. And third, an agreement on a common roadmap that can really drive and support these important changes. The accelerator's ambition is to ensure the necessary policy support and financing to create 400 million decent jobs, especially in the green care and digital economy, and extend social protection to the more than 4 billion people without coverage today. And in so doing, to proactively anticipate and equitably manage the different transitions that are pending, environmental, social, and economic. Creating strong links between policy support and financial support is absolutely key. And for this, we need detailed financing frameworks. These frameworks should include both domestic and external funding streams based on the key principle of solidarity, allowing countries to meet their policy ambitions while also ensuring that the global financial architecture serves the needs of the real economy and people rather than that of a tiny elite. This is what a human-centered response to multiple crises looks like. Thank you. Thank you, and it's good to hear yes. And I believe we have someone here who will also be advancing the accelerator, Guy Ryder, who will make sure that some of the things we just heard about will be taken into the United Nations. So important to see that coordination between the ILO. So it's not just the ILO working on this, but the United Nations as well, so that we can have a coordinated strategy. So we have heard from many people here on the stage. Now I wanna turn it all over to you. I know many of you here have your own strategies and I'm gonna call this a lightning round, which means we're gonna be quick. We're gonna share strategies. This isn't a time for speeches, but like, what are you doing? What are some of the ways you have been campaigning? Like we heard from our um, sisters and brothers on the panel today. What measures have you campaigned for to protect and invest in workers' jobs and incomes in the wake of so many of these global shocks, social protection strategies? So let me ask all of you, what is the number one priority for your union to ensure recovery and resilience? So please, if you have some thoughts, head to the microphone. We are asking for one to two minute maximum, really just some quick ideas so that we can share with each other some best practices. Someone, okay, I can't see over there. Thank you. Go ahead. I guess. Oui, alors bonjour. Je m'appelle Caroline Senville. Je suis présidente de la Confédération des syndicats nationaux au Québec, au Canada. Euh, je voulais intervenir sur les services éducatifs à la petite enfance parce que, Mme Smallwood l'a dit, euh, au Canada, c'est un peu compliqué, les services sociaux, les services gouvernementaux. Et au Québec, on est fiers de dire qu'on a des services à la petite enfance à très faible coût depuis maintenant 25 ans, haute lutte syndicale et féministe. Et ça, ça a eu comme effet que moins de dix ans plus tard, la hausse du produit intérieur brut du Québec, à cause de, des services à la petite enfance, à cause de la participation accrue des femmes au marché du travail, l'impact sur le PIB, presque 2 Alors, c'est une bonne raison, c'est bien pour les enfants qui ont des services éducatifs, c'est bien pour les familles, Mais une économie ne peut pas rouler rondement si on n'appuie pas l'ensemble des forces du travail, dont celle de la moitié de la population, euh, la population des femmes. Maintenant, les travailleuses en service de garde sont largement syndiquées et la bataille continue pour faire améliorer leurs conditions de travail parce que, on le sait, et ça aussi c'est une bataille de la CSI quand on est dans le care, quand on est dans le soin, y compris le soin des, des tout-petits. Souvent, euh, notre salaire n'est pas à la hauteur du travail que l'on fait et je peux dire que nous continuons cette bataille ici. Thank you so much. Great. Great ideas coming out of Canada, I have to say. I mean, this is wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Who, next, please. Thank you. Reciban un saludo de los delegados y las delegadas de México. Aquí se ha hablado de empleo, de protección social, de salario. 
son parte integrante del trabajo decente. El trabajo decente evidentemente también implica el reconocimiento a los derechos colectivos, como del que ya se ha hablado aquí, como es la negociación colectiva. Y hablan de sus experiencias y todas las he escuchado y son muy buenas y reconocibles. Nosotros aprendemos mucho de ellos. Sin embargo, también existen algunos países en donde se transgreden estos derechos y que también generan una crisis, una crisis social. Es el caso de los trabajadores y trabajadoras periodistas del Estado mexicano, que ayer cumplieron mil días de huelga en un contexto de pandemia, en un contexto de terremoto, en un contexto de persecución, en un contexto de acoso policial. Pero también hay que señalar algo muy claro. Este movimiento ha resistido a partir de la solidaridad de otros sindicatos hermanos, sindicatos independientes. Pero también la solidaridad internacional es un factor importante para que los movimientos sindicales permanezcan, persistan, aguanten. Y esto, sin duda alguna, es también un elemento importante para evitar esas crisis, esas crisis que se pueden ir incrementando a lo largo y ancho del mundo, si desde la solidaridad internacional, si desde el movimiento sindical no ponemos manos a la obra. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias. From Mexico, over to this microphone. And just please introduce yourself and your union. Thank you. Um, my name is Jan Schriever. I'm from FNV, the Netherlands. Uh, we have a uh, big problem with long COVID um, uh, in, among our workers who did in the beginning of the pandemic all the necessary work and were sent in to do this work without protective equipment. Mm -hmm. So they got ill, and we found out that they stayed ill. Uh, a lot of people didn't recover from the first wave of, uh, of COVID. In the Netherlands, uh, you are protected for two years, that your wages are paid, but these two years are now over, and we found out that a lot of people lost their job. And it means that they uh, increase in their uh, wages over 30%. And in this time, when prices are getting higher, it's a big, big problem. And we blame our government that they send these people in because they said, well, these masks didn't work, so you don't need masks first, instead of telling that they didn't have the masks. And because one and a half year later, they said only medical masks is a must, not some clothing in front of your mouth. So we want to know if other countries have also this problem with this long COVID, because we are fighting with our government uh, to do something for these care workers and teachers, uh, because they were also sent to do the jobs. So that was the question that we have for our comments here. Thank you. Thank you. And if people have ideas to exchange, we welcome you to come to the microphone. Over here, please, please introduce yourself. Grazie, grazie. E io rappresento il popolo anziano, gli ex lavoratori. Io sono il responsabile della FERPA, la Federazione Europea dei Sindacati, che è una federazione della CES. E credo che la protezione sociale ha un'importanza vitale per questi ex lavoratori, non solo anziani, perché spesse volte si vede il pensionato e l'anziano come se non fosse legato al mondo del lavoro. Siamo tutti ex lavoratori. Ed ecco perché è importante e vorrei sapere come intendete proteggere questa popolazione, perché ha bisogno dei diritti che non sono prettamente legati all'anziano, ma sono diritti universali, come giusto rivalutare i salari, come però rivalutare le pensioni, perché un popolo è legato a delle pensioni, è legato alla sua indicizzazione, è legato anche a una pensione minima per salvaguardare anche e per combattere la povertà. Ecco, è una domanda che io faccio a tutto, visto che questa è una sisi mondiale, come poterci organizzare a livello mondiale per, per dei diritti che sono universali. Voi oggi abbiamo applaudito perché il 50% sono donne, in queste, hanno le delegate. 
le donne pensionate subiscono una riduzione delle pensioni del 30% perché nella loro vita non c'è stata trasparenza salariale e perché hanno fatto altri mestieri, accudiri familiari, accudiri genitori, accudiri figli e pertanto non c'è stato un lavoro continuo. Come si intende tutelare queste donne ex lavoratrici e che hanno anche una pensione decurtata oltre ad avere pensioni basse? Ed ecco perché è fondamentale un ultimo diritto e finisco. Lo shock l'ha vissuto questo popolo di anziani perché sulla pandemia in alcuni paesi ha fatta la strage e bisogna investire sulle case di cura, sulla sanità, sulla sanità universale che possa far sentire l'anziano protetto non dai governi che spesse volte sono, li considerano un peso ma noi come considerare, noi come CES ci stiamo facendo una battaglia su questo perché vogliamo dare dignità ai cittadini di qualsiasi età. Ecco perché vorrei sentire il vostro pensiero, perché è una battaglia che noi a livello europeo, che è un'Europa che, un, diciamo un che sta invecchiando, ce la stiamo mettendo tutta, però vorrei capire anche il vostro pensiero, perché gli, gli anziani, io sono anziano, sono un nonno è europeo, ma anche mondiale. Grazie e buon lavoro. Thank you for being a citizen of the world and for continuing to fight for those kinds of social protections and justice. Over to the next microphone, please introduce yourself. Buon pomeriggio a tutte e tutti, sono Ivana Veronese, segretaria nazionale della UIL. Durante la pandemia abbiamo fatto due cose molto importanti. La prima, un accordo con il governo sulla sicurezza delle lavoratrici e dei lavoratori e sui sistemi di protezione. Abbiamo creato dei comitati in ogni territorio ma anche in ogni azienda. Abbiamo fatto consegnare a carico delle aziende le mascherine per le protezioni dei lavoratori. Certo, quando non ce n'erano, ce n'erano poche, prima alla sanità, alla protezione civile e poi a tutte le lavoratrici e i lavoratori. È un protocollo che abbiamo ancora in vigore, seppur con misure più lente. E dall'altra parte abbiamo garantito protezione sociale a tutte le lavoratrici e i lavoratori, dai piccoli autonomi a tutte le persone e anche il blocco dei licenziamenti che ha funzionato per molti mesi. Certo, abbiamo perso le lavoratrici e i lavoratori precari che potevano essere tenuti dalle aziende con l'ammortizzatore sociale, ma spesso sono stati lasciati a casa. Tante erano donne e giovani, quelle donne e quei giovani che ancora oggi fanno fatica a rientrare nel mondo del lavoro o ci entrano con lavori poveri. C'è bisogno di servizi che, eh, asili nido, eh, in, in Italia c'è una diversità tra il nord e il sud dell'Italia, eh, come dire, protezione sociale per gli anziani. Abbiamo queste necessità per permettere alle donne di entrare nel mondo del lavoro non a part time ma a tempo pieno con lavori fissi e regolari. Gli asili nido sono importanti, sono importanti per le donne ma sono importanti anche per l'educazione dei bambini. Su questo anche con le risorse del Piano Nazionale di Ripresa e Resilienza stiamo come dire, supportando il governo perché si realizzino presto per dare anche alle donne la possibilità di lavorare in lavori stabili e ben pagati. È una sfida complicata e molto difficile. Thank you so much. We have time for um, one Two, two last comments. Thank you. I see people at both microphones. We'll start here and then we will end. You, you get the final word over there. So over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, Diana Holland from the TUC in the UK. Two quick points. Firstly, one issue that was extremely hard fought for us was employers using the global shock to threaten everything, the fundamentals. And we had fire and rehire where people, unless you accept reductions in terms, conditions, and pay, then we sack you and re-employ you if you apply on the lower terms and conditions. And we had to be very united to fight back against that. The second one is equality impact assessments carried out of all the changes that were being proposed 
before they were made to make sure they didn't disproportionately disadvantage or cause more discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. Great ideas. <laughs> Final word over here. Over to you. Yes, please. thank you very much. My, na my name is Elke Hanak from the DGB. Ich möchte noch mal in meiner Sprache zwei Dinge ansprechen. Das eine ist, wir haben in Deutschland, und ich glaube, da bleiben wir auch nicht alleine, während der Pandemie einen echten Rollback in der Gleichstellungspolitik erlebt. Ganz viele Frauen sind gezwungenermaßen, weil die Kinderbetreuung zu hatte, weil Schulen über Monate geschlossen hatten, gezwungen gewesen, ihren Job aufzugeben und nach Hause zu gehen und wieder sich um Kinderbetreuung, Haushalt, care und Homeschooling zu kümmern. Das haben überwiegend die Frauen übernommen, nicht die Männer. So, und diese Frauen wieder aus der, wir nennen das, stillen Reserve des Arbeitsmarktes herauszuholen, ist wirklich eine Riesenaufgabe. Weil das brauchen wir und das fehlte mir hier mal ein bisschen. Wir müssen uns alle miteinander dafür stark machen, dass Frauen es ermöglicht wird, eine eigenständige Existenzsicherung auch aufzubauen. Und gerade diese Frauen, die nach Hause gegangen sind, arbeiteten in sogenannten typischen Frauenberufen. Das waren die, die systemrelevant waren zum Teil in der Pandemie, die Einzelhandelskauffrauen, die Frauen an, der, an den Kassen der Einzel Handelsbetriebe, das waren die Reinigungsfrauen, das waren Pflegerinnen und Pfleger, alle haben sie beklatscht, Lehrerinnen, Erzieherinnen, alle haben sie beklatscht in der Pandemie. Wie toll sie ihre Arbeit machen. Nach der Pandemie sind sie fast wieder vergessen. So, und da müssen wir, glaube ich, viel Kraft reinlegen, diese frauendominierten, aber systemrelevanten Berufe aufzuwerten. Das ist mir ein Anliegen. Die Arbeitgeber klagen genau in diesen Berufen über Fachkräftemangel. Und da kann die Pandemie mit zu tun haben. Aus dem Hotel- und Gaststättenbereich sind bei uns viele, viele Frauen entlassen worden, die nicht wieder zurückgehen in diesen Bereich, die einen anderen Beruf erwählen. Und das war auch vor der Pandemie schon so, dass diese Branchen wie Hotel- und Gaststätten, aber auch andere Schwierigkeiten hatten, Fachpersonal zu finden. Und warum haben sie diese Schwierigkeiten gehabt? Weil sie wirklich schlechte Arbeitsbedingungen angeboten haben. Und solange Arbeitgeber nicht an ihrer Attraktivität arbeiten, werden wir das Problem des Fachkräftemangels nicht lösen. Und deshalb finde ich, ist es wichtig, dass wir auch unserer Jugend Perspektiven geben und eine echte Ausbildungsgarantie, ein Recht auf eine berufliche Ausbildung ihnen auch zugestehen. Und ein letzter Punkt in der Pandemie Jetzt muss ich einmal kurz äh, überlegen, wer ich mich noch nennen wollte. Nee, ist weg. Okay, vielen Dank. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We're for reminding us of all those workers that were cheered on the front lines and then we forgot, forgot them and, and need to make sure that we are building now exactly what we talked about today, a good social protection floor, good jobs, decent work, good wages. And so, Sisters and brothers, thank you very much for this very rich exchange. Thank you to our panelists. What is clear from this session is that all over the world, unions have been on the front lines. All of you have been on the front lines, driving your government's recovery and resilience plans, making sure you're not only shaping the policies, but making sure there's effective implementation. You are fighting to win quality jobs, decent wages, and strengthen social protection. Front and center are all of you to these efforts. So thank you for everything you're doing. We're now gonna close this session. And perhaps as I call up my brother, Owen Tudor, who will be leading the next session, everyone should just stand up and kind of move around a little bit because it's cold in here. I think I, I saw the Norwegians even tweeted it's cold. That means we are all cold. So everyone stand up. Move around a little bit. We're going to get ready to hear from Owen Tudor and the next panel. And thank you so much for your participation.
got rap on. We need Marta. Marta, can you come up? No, health and safety. No, the uh, peace is afterwards, not supply chain. Right, hopefully you've all had enough time to get a little bit warmer. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you go quite so far as to hug each other for the warmth, but we're now going to start talking about an issue that's really dear to my heart, and I hope to yours. In fact, the last couple of years of campaigning have suggested that it's central to the heart of most trade unionists. My name's Owen Tudor. I'm Deputy General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, but I've spent most of my working life at the British Trades Union Congress, where for 10 years I was a member of the UK Health and Safety Commission. So my background is solidly in the fight for occupational safety and health. And I want to start by drawing your attention to this pamphlet. There aren't many of these pamphlets around because this is the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights and Work and its follow-up. Guy, down at the front here, wrote a preface to this pamphlet, but this is a different pamphlet from the Declaration on Fundamental Principles that many of you will have come across. Because this Declaration on Fundamental Principles has an additional fundamental principle. This has been printed in the last few weeks and it contains the fundamental principle that workers should have a right to a healthy and safe working environment. The first extension of the Declaration in a quarter of a century to add to the other fundamental principles. And I think we should give a big round of applause to everyone who fought the fight to get that new fundamental principle established. So this, this little pamphlet, is what we achieved in June at the International Labour Conference. It doesn't, in that sense, look like an enormous achievement. But it really was, and the real achievement is not going to be getting this pamphlet and getting the new words in this pamphlet, but actually getting that right made real for working people around the world. Because it took a while to achieve what we achieved, but there's still an awful lot more to be done. And what we want to spend the next 45 minutes talking about is how to put workers first in putting workers' health and safety first. We've got a great panel. We've got Ambit from BWI, Liam from the Australian Council of Trade Unions, Repon from BFTUC Bangladesh, and Marta from the CGT Argentina. And we'll be having a video from Catalane, our workers group chair at the ILO, who led the negotiations for the recognition that a health and safety 
working environment is a fundamental principle and right. But the first person I want to call on is Ambert, because I want to pay tribute to the enormous work that Ambert and his colleagues at Building, uh, Building Workers International did to actually get us the fundamental right, because I think BWI did more than anybody else around the world to, to campaign for that right, and in particular, to get employers, progressive employers, some presumably am, but not so progressive, but open to persuasion, to sign up to the idea. And that allowed us to go to the ILC in June and persuade governments and the other employers that they had to agree with us that health and safety was a fundamental right. So I want to ask Ambert to tell us why it was so important to campaign for that fundamental principle among his members and in his industry, and how they actually did it, and what fantastic work that they did. And I don't want any false modesty from you, Amber, about what that achievement was. So Amber, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Owen. Good afternoon, everyone. And Owen, thank you because, you know, during the campaign, you brought us all together, the, the global unions, ITUC, the workers group, you brought us together and coordinated this campaign. Thank you for that. So I, I just came from uh, Auckland a few days ago and a Filipino migrant worker died due to the faulty scaffolding. Four cement workers born, burned dead in the Hulsim cement plant in Uganda. Every day we are receiving reports of fatalities forestry workers in the Amazon, construction workers in Montenegro working for a Chinese multinational company. Many workers died in a building collapse in India, four fatalities in the construction of Grand Paris, biggest rail transport network as they prepare for the Paris 2024 Olympics. In 2016, ILO and WHO estimated 1.9 million people died due to work-related diseases and injuries. And for construction workers, wood and forestry workers, more than 100,000 died, uh, are killed every year. Jobs shouldn't kill. I repeat, jobs shouldn't kill. Health and safety has always been in the core of our, of our BWI campaign, but the COVID-19 pandemic gave us the opportunity to bring health and safety in the center of the global public debate. With a coordinated campaign, global campaign of ITUC, the Global Union, the workers group at the ILO, health and safety is now a fundamental right. This is a union victory. This is a victory of the ITUC. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> now, Owen, I'll be modest with our contribution. So BWI contributed to this campaign. We did a grassroots approach, a bottom-up approach. We mobilized our members. We asked our members engage your employers, ask them to sign a joint declaration supporting health and safety as a fundamental right. After three months, we were able to get more than 445 declarations at the workplaces, with enterprises, with the National Employers Association, with the European Employers Construction Association, with multinational companies. That's why I don't understand why the employer's representative during the ILC were very resistant. We told them more than 200,000 employers covering more than 20 million construction wood and forestry workers supported our demand for health and safety as a fundamental right. For BWI, Health and safety is not for negotiation. It's non-negotiable. But our job is not done. We have to take action. And we have 
to bring this fight at the workplace level, making sure that health and safety is prioritized, protected, and enforced in every work site. So, uh, Owen, we actually already started a campaign uh, after this. Uh, we have a three R on BWA health and safety campaign. That is recruitment, representation, and regular inspection. Recruitment, health and safety is an organizing tool. We use health and safety as entry point to organize trade union. And I can tell you so far, we have won many organizing battles. Representation, safety committees must be organized in every work site. No amount of safety management system will work without workers' participation. Like regular inspection, we believe trade union must not now take a role as safety inspectors. Just to conclude, from the CFMEU Building Union in Australia, uh, they have a message for all of us. Safety is union business. Stand up, speak out, come home safe. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Amber. Uh, we're now going to have a video uh, message from Kathleen Passier, who uh, can't be with us today, but she's the, the chair of the workers' group at the ILO, and she led the negotiations this June to get the recognition of uh, a safe and healthy working environment uh, for, uh, for workers. So uh, can we roll the video? so that uh, you can see Kathleen's message about how this changes the game at the ILO. Colleagues, we did it. Since June this year, the right to a safe and healthy working environment has been formally recognized and declared a fundamental right at work. I congratulate all the activists in our movement who have fought so hard over the last few years to achieve this historic victory. A great thanks to all your actions and support. This result is literally of life importance for millions of workers in the world. The facts and figures speak for themselves. On average, every day, almost half a million people fall victim to work-related illnesses. There are close to one million occupational accidents every day. 2.3 million women and men around the world die from work-related accidents or diseases every year, and that is over 6,000 deaths every day. Every single one of those deaths is a human and social tragedy that could and should have been avoided. In 1998, when the ILO adopted the Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, the world agreed that freedom of association and collective bargaining freedom from child labor and forced labor are fundamental human rights inherent to all workers regardless of sector or occupation. These rights must be protected and respected in all ILO countries. Also when they have not ratified the related core conventions. The absence of health and safety in this list was a historic mistake. The fact that this mistake is now corrected gives trade unions and workers in every country a strong legal and political tool to claim their right to health and safety at work. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has once more demonstrated the urgency for strong actions in the area of health and safety as part of a human-centered recovery. The ILO now must really demonstrate and further develop its leadership on the topic. This is critical, as many other players with less commitment to workers' rights are claiming expertise in the area. As the resolution that was adopted in June this year says, a safe and healthy working environment requires the active participation of governments, employers and workers through a system of defined rights, responsibilities and duties, as well as through social dialogue and cooperation. This is what the ILO now needs to push forward. It must step up its actions to assist member states in aligning their laws and policies and ensuring effective enforcement while pushing for universal ratification 
of the new core conventions, Convention 155 and 187. It must also at international level claim its unique mandate and authority in this area within the UN system and towards, for instance, WTO and IMF and insist on the respect of occupational health and safety in everything they do. How can unions push their governments to deliver on this right? For unions, it's important to realize that at every workplace, everywhere in the world, workers can now claim their fundamental right to health and safety. They can and should increase the pressure on governments and employers to respect the principles enshrined in Convention 155 and 187. And unions should also push for ratification of the new core conventions. They should demand, of course, to be properly consulted on their ratification, implementation and enforcement. Be aware that the ILO's fundamental rights are of key importance worldwide due to their inclusion in social clauses in trade and other agreements, business and human rights legislation and corporate policies. Unions must demand from governments and companies to update their trade agreements and policies to include explicitly the right to occupational health and safety. 6,000 workers dying each day at work is unacceptable. Recognition of occupational safety and health as a fundamental right is a first step. Now it needs to be implemented and enforced in law and in practice in all our countries. Let's join forces on this. Thank you. So I want to say a great big thanks to Kathleen for the work that she did, uh, ably assisted by your own Bernat and uh, several other people in the, uh, at the ILO in, in fighting for that, uh, that right. We've now got our three uh, panelists here. Uh, I'm going to invite them each in turn to answer a key question. First, Liam O'Brien, who's Assistant Secretary at the uh, Australian Council of Trade Unions. Um, Liam, the question that British uh, trade unionists will be wanting to ask you is how you react to the news that Neighbours is being brought back on television for 2023. Or, or alternatively, you might want to say something about asbestos. Because you've been leading the campaign globally to ban asbestos. Uh, and, and really what I want to know from you, uh, and what I think other people in the audience will really want to know from you, um, is uh, what unions are calling for in this campaign and why global commitments in this area are so important. Thank you, Owen. I, I will address the neighbours thing just firstly because it's, it's a great union workplace and it's good to see more union jobs being created in particular in this state in Victoria. Um, but before I do, I would like to start by acknowledging traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, this land was stolen, never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I do also want to acknowledge the amazing work of the ITUC and the trade union movement in securing health and safety as a fundamental right. And whilst brothers and sisters, health and safety has always been a fundamental right for us here, I think we can all agree that a healthy and safe working environment is far from a reality for many people in the world. Every year, nearly three million workers will die from work-related causes. Hundreds of millions more will be injured or made ill as a result of their work. Whether it be excessive hours or traumatic workplace incidents or exposure to hazardous substances like asbestos, every one of these diseases and deaths is preventable and it is a violation of our collective right to healthy and safe work. Australia knows only too well the dangers of asbestos use. Ours is a story of tragedy, deceit, struggle and continuing sacrifice. As a miner, manufacturer and user of asbestos for all of the last century, we were some of the highest per capita users of asbestos in the world and the consequences of this remain. Today, 4,000 Australians will die from asbestos-related diseases each year. This is a number that despite banning asbestos in this country in all its forms nearly 20 years ago, continues to grow. Asbestos is so ubiquitous in our built environment, the community exposure is now commonplace. 
and we see an increasing number of non-occupational deaths now arising from exposure. In Australia, we know that until it is safely and completely removed, our future will continue to be plagued with death and disease. This reality is our legacy. It is this reality that drives our moral obligation to warn the world of the risks of asbestos, a substance that causes the deaths of more than 250,000 people every year. Producers and employers have known these risks for decades and continued to push this product throughout the world. Long banned in the global north, we still see more than a million tonnes of asbestos produced and traded globally, much of it coming to our region, to developing nations, particularly those in the Asia Pacific, setting them up for a similar future of misery. Australian unions are committed to standing with and supporting unions and workers in our region and around the world to ban the use of asbestos. Through Union Aid Abroad, a feeder, we work with unions, workers and governments to affect national bans. As a movement, we are also deeply committed to strengthening our global frameworks, treaties and conventions, including Convention 162, that regulates the use and trade of hazardous chemicals such as asbestos. The Rotterdam Convention is another such treaty. It is a critical mechanism in our global OSH framework. The Convention requires exporters of listed hazardous chemicals to seek the prior informed consent of importing countries before shipment. It's a treaty that safeguards the right to know principle in our international chemicals management system. However, comrades, the Rotterdam Convention is under threat. The consensus principle that determines the listing of hazardous chemicals is being abused. A small number of countries, including Russia, that have a direct financial interest in the prolonged trade of asbestos is holding the Convention hostage and endangering workers and the community. The ACTU, along with more than 40 unions, national centres, global union federations like BWI and NGOs have formed an alliance to campaign to reform the Convention and end the listing blockade on asbestos. Last month, we were pleased to see that the first goal of this campaign was achieved when governments of Switzerland, Australia, Mali and Burkina Faso submitted a proposal to amend the text of the Convention to bypass the blockade. At the Conference of the Parties in May next year, we hope to win this fight and see the amendment succeed, and we need your support. The global trade union movement must unite to protect and strengthen the Convention, ensure that governments have a right to know about the hazardous substances that enter their country so that workers' lives can be protected. Comrades, asbestos continues to be one of the biggest killers of workers in the world. It must be banned and eradicated from our built environment. Our failure to achieve this goal will not only condemn, but will condemn further generations of workers to increasing mi misery. We urge national action by everyone here committed to ensuring a healthy and safe working environment to see the Convention strengthened. And I thank you for your support and solidarity. So thanks very much for that, Liam. Marta, uh, you're the legal director of CGT Argentina from UOCRA. Uh, both CGT and UOCRA have been at the forefront of promoting occupational safety and health throughout Argentina in a variety of ways, from training, negotiating, collective bargaining agreements, and shaping national legislation. Can you tell us a bit about how that works for working people? Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Owen. Gracias a todos. Buenas tardes, todas y todos, a los compañeros de panel. Realmente, en, en síntesis de estos cinco minutos, les cuento que el movimiento sindical argentino siempre ha tenido eh, la salud y seguridad como un eje estratégico de su lucha sindical. En el caso de la CGT, eh, promoviendo acciones y campañas, fortaleciendo, fortaleciendo los espacios tripartitos y de, como una instancia de acción tuvimos la posibilidad de discutir una ley de prevención, consensuar un texto en base a la tríada, a los tres convenios de la OIT, que junto con empleadores, trabajadores y el gobierno lo hemos consensuado y estamos esperando ahora 
que el Congreso de la Nación se decida darle tratamiento parlamentario. Eh, refiriéndole a nosotros como construcción, ya dentro del marco que nos ha dado AMBET, de la nuestra internacional de la construcción de la madera, la consideración de que es una actividad de alta siniestralidad, pero que no justifica la cantidad de, de fallecidos y muertos en el trabajo en accidentes prevenibles, y sobre todo en aquellas enfermedades relacionadas con el trabajo. En esta línea, eh, tanto UOCRA, como, que es mi sindicato de base de la construcción de la República Argentina, como las centrales sindicales, la CGT y las dos centrales que también comparten en Argentina, seguimos los lineamientos de la CCI, de la CCA y en nuestro caso de la Internacional de la Construcción de la Madera. Por eso creemos que, se hacen, que la, la idea es hacer acción sindical con equipos multidisciplinarios. Hemos creado equipos especiales que junto con los dirigentes sindicales que ejercen esta función gremial, estos equipos profesionales tienen el, la visita de obra donde detectan los riesgos y los denuncian a la autoridad, ¿para qué? Para, para activar, para, para presionar a que haya una inspección del trabajo. Eh, cuando se inicia la pandemia en una situación imprevista donde teníamos la obra pública en Argentina declarada esencial, quiere decir que los trabajadores tenían que ir a las obras, pudimos acordar en forma paritaria por medio de la negociación colectiva con la Cámara Empresario los protocolos de salud y seguridad COVID. Esto no implicaba solamente la seguridad de obras, sino la seguridad en el transporte, desde el domicilio de la trabajadora o trabajador a las obras en construcción. En el caso de los este, trabajadores y trabajadores de las obras civiles, estos los únicos que pudimos hacer, ya que no tenían permiso de trabajar durante el primer tramo de la pandemia, era asegurar y garantizar su salario. Eh, estas acciones son muy importantes en tres líneas. Primero, las acciones formativas, que es formación en oficios y tecnicaturas en salud y seguridad en el trabajo, que las da el propio sindicato. Segundo, esta acción inspectiva, que es forzar, presionar a la inspección del trabajo para que ejerza esta, eh, el ejercicio del poder de policía sobre el cumplimiento de las normas y sobre todo las nuevas cláusulas de, de negociación colectiva. En las nuevas cláusulas de negociación colectiva tenemos la incorporación de las mujeres trabajadoras y su seguridad laboral, afectadas no solamente a aquellos oficios históricos donde definían que las mujeres de la construcción tenían que ir, sino en, aquellos, en estos oficios especializados con el uso de la tecnología. Eso implica el ejercicio de nuevas pautas para que la mujer trabajadora constructora en Argentina pueda ejercer los oficios. Realmente nosotros creemos que hay una, una obligación de un entorno seguro al trabajo y saludable. Creemos en la importancia, pero fundamental, de la vigencia de los convenios de la OIT, pero como todos sabemos, no solamente en su texto, sino en su aplicación efectiva a nivel nacional. Estamos, creo, teniendo muchísimos eh, desafíos las nuevas tecnologías que impactan en las nuevas modalidades de trabajo, tenemos los trabajadores de plataforma, tenemos el teletrabajo, pero también tenemos la exposición de aquellas personas trabajadoras que se exponen a nuevas sustancias peligrosas. Estos desafíos implican, y en estos 40 segundos lo quiero decir, que si bien somos humildes sabiendo que nos falta muchísimo, también estamos orgullosos de lo que podemos hacer. Pero Argentina ya pasó quizás la pandemia o lo peor de la pandemia, pero hoy tiene una crisis económica y social que nos obliga nuevamente a estar alertas porque nuevamente se pueden debilitar las condiciones laborales. Y la salud y seguridad del trabajo es una prioridad que no debemos perder porque ahí está la vida y la salud de nuestras trabajadoras y trabajadores. Muchísimas gracias. And last but not least, Repo. You've been heavily involved in the campaign for a biological hazards convention at global level. Can you tell us why you're calling for this convention and what it would mean for workers in Bangladesh? Uh, thank you, Wayne. We have been watching that uh, biological hazards employers don't want to admit exist. Both infectious and non-infectious biological hazards can be a significant health threat in numerous sectors and workplaces. For example, uh, the communica communicable disease alone are estimated to have caused 310,000 work-related deaths worldwide in 2021, 120,000 of which were due to COVID-19. 
We have been uh, observed in Bangladesh that pandemic had drawn a serious national trade union attention to the need for public policies put in place to deal with COVID-19 at workplace. Biological hazards were and had long been a significant concern across all sectors. Therefore, we are looking for a new international standards which should be applicable to all at-risk jobs and sectors and all biological hazards uh, should be covered. The risk assessment and hierarchy of control approaches should be central to the response. The ILO Convention number 155 and 187 as fundamental conventions and calling for that to guide us on framing of a new convention on biological hazards. Dear friends, the newly adopted technical guideline on biological hazards in the working environment as adopted in June this year, paving the way for developing a new convention in ILO on biological hazards at work environment near future. We strongly believe that freedom of association and collective bargaining are the highest form of social dialogue. Without those two enabling rights, workers would be impeded from achieving a healthy working environment and obstructed from implementing these guidelines. The newly adopted uh, guideline define a biological hazard as any microorganisms, cells, or other organic mat materials that may be of plant, animal, or human origin, including any which have been gen genetically modified, which can cause harm to human health, more particularly to workers' health. This may include, but not limited to, bacteria, viruses, par parasites, fungi, DNA materials, body fluids, and other microorganisms and their associated allergens and toxins. The adopted tripartite guidelines in this year are the first for this type of risk. They provide specific advice aligned with international labor standards on preventing and controlling work-related injuries, disease, and death related to exposure of to biological hazards in the working environment. These include questions related to the responsibilities and right of competent authorities, employers, occupational health service, workers, workplace risk management, workers' health surveillance, and preparedness and response to emergencies. Guideline that refers to the range of job in which risk from biological hazards arose, the nature of the exposure and the preventive measures to be employed and a detailed elaboration of the appropriate provisions for social dialogue to implement the risk assessment and hierarchy of control approaches. We feel the need for greater emphasis on the occupational health services provisions and functions laid out in the Occupational Health Service Convention, that means Convention number 169, including health surveillance and cohering not co uh, notification, reporting and review systems at the workplace sector and national levels. Dear friends, we are hoping that the 112 and 113 session of the International Labor Conference, which will take place in 2024 and 2025, shall discuss for a new standards covering biological hazards as part of the review of the ILO Occupational Safety and Health Normative Framework. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Fantastic presentations. There's some really hard work being done around the world uh, and at global level by our trade union colleagues uh, on these issues. And now I want to ask you uh, in, the, uh, in the audience, I want to ask you two questions. Uh, I'm not asking these people, they've already done their work. Uh, I want to ask you, What's your union doing to advance safe and secure workplaces? What are you doing to protect working people? Or you could answer another question, which is how are you using occupational health and safety to build stronger trade unions? So uh, I'm looking out into the audience. Who wants to come first at one of the microphones? Yeah, down there in the front. Thank you. Shota Jawahadze, I representative Georgian Trade Union, particularly Construction and Forestry Independent Trade Union, and so we are member international organization, BVI. 
We started with the head general secretary, Amber Taliusin, and uh, I think this is a refresh and a force for improve occupational safety and health at the workplace. We understand that this is not cover everything, but I think we make better situation on workplace what we have. This is important. What I mean, safety, our life, this is, a, I think, fundamental principle human rights. Thank you. Fantastic stuff, and clearly uh, a lot of the work that's been done in Georgia is about in, in increasing uh, inspections. We've got another comment over here. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Karen Batt from the Community and Public Sector Union and ACTU delegate. One of the uh, issues that we've been confronting post-COVID predominantly has been the issue of occupational violence and concerns around the psychosocial impact of attitudes to workers for government. We've had some significant issues dealing with abuse, um, hostile um, clients of government workers, and as a result, we've been working quite hard with uh, WorkSafe Victoria to develop a toolkit to deal with uh, mental health and wellbeing within workplaces. And the focus on that has been to look at how you go about dealing with um, issues that may confront and uh, distress people, whether it's violence at work, whether it's sexual harassment, whether it's attacks on someone because they're a person of colour. These are all issues that are occupational health and safety issues from a psychosocial point of view. And we've developed a toolkit to try and provide real-time evidence to um, assist workers going into public sector jobs, not so they think that they are going in just to work in a government safe job, but to understand the type of work they're doing, whether it's in a prison, whether it's in child protection, whether it's in public housing, drug and alcohol counselling, family violence, all of these work, all of this work has quite a confrontational aspect to it. Being able to have the tools to deal with that is, a, is was we believe, a very fundamental health and safety strategy that has been worked on by our union. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. And I'm glad to see we're beginning to get cues at the microphones. I'm going to ask Caroli first and then the sister in, in front of me. But Caroli first. Thank you very much. Uh, really thanks for the panel for this exciting discussion. I want to point out the importance of the workers' health and safety representatives. Because Owen, you also put a question, what are we doing as trade unions? What should we do as trade unions? We should simply strengthen the system of health and safety reps of the workers. And we have to make it possible that our trade unions have the capacity, knowledge, know-how to support them. We have had the experience also in Central and Eastern Europe, in different countries, that where trade unions take it over to their hands and work together with the health and safety reps, establishing networks, that helps. And at the end of the day, we have to do the job at the workplaces. I've been doing a lot on European level for a long time, but I realize the real stuff is at the workplace, and that is our responsibility as trade unions. Uh, second, uh, you also put the question, how can we use health and safety? In my understanding, health and safety is the issue which is a common stuff for all the workers. And once as trade unions, we approach them to promote their health and safety standards at the workplace, they will be positively responding. And that is a means for organizing. And then I get back to Sharon, organizing, organizing, organizing. Thanks. Thanks very much, Karoli. The sister, yeah. Uh, thank you. Health and safety had been one of the challenges that our informal workers are facing in our country. And that's a priority we have established in CFTUI. The women workers especially, and many of them having uh, counted on the public system, today governments are privatizing and business is being done on health. So it's a primary concern. Taking this as a challenge, 
CFTUI had been organizing workers. And for the last 20 years, we had been looking at a health, comprehensive health measures for the workers, taking this as an opportunity to organize them. And especially the ESI coverage, is, which is one of the best in the world, wherein number of health coverage has been, it may be the medical facility, it may, the, it may be the loss of work, attendance, uh, PF, number of uh, eight components have been added into the ESI. So it had been a long struggle for us, and in the coming days too, we as unorganized workers are asking for the health of the workers. And this is a daily dialogue we have done with the local to the national uh, government representatives, the politicians, also to make it as a political agenda manifesto in the elections to bring in so that the health of the people are protected so that our workers have basic right to health and rights. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. We've got time for just two more very quick comments, but I will have to ask them to be quick. So the sister here and then the sister, sister there. So first, yeah. Je suis uh, Asma Ouba, je viens de la Guinée-Conakry, je représente uh, mon secrétaire général de la centrale syndicale, l'ONSLG. Quand on parle de l'environnement tra du travail sûr, je veux dire que moi, en tant que syndicaliste, on ne peut pas travailler dans un environnement si ce n'est pas sûr et sain. Parce que, avant tout, d'abord, c'est la sécurité dans un milieu de travail. Nous, nous défendons les travailleurs des hôtels et les travailleurs domestiques. Je suis la présidente du réseau africain des travailleurs domestiques. Vous savez, c'est un secteur vulnérable qui travaille derrière les portes, loin des regards. Donc, ils sont en train de subir beaucoup de choses. Si leur environnement n'est pas sain, ça serait difficile. Et quand on parle de la santé et de la sécurité au milieu du travail, Vous savez, dans les hôtels, par exemple, les, travail, les hôteliers ont des heures impossibles. Il y en a qui travaillent la nuit, le temps de se déplacer et venir, il n'y a pas de navette. Ils subissent beaucoup d'accidents et de, et de viols ou bien de... Beaucoup de choses qui ne sont pas bonnes pour euh, leur personne. Et quant aux travailleurs domestiques, quand on parle de la sécurité, les travailleurs domestiques, beaucoup n'ont pas d'équipement de, de travail. Ils travaillent avec les vitres, ils nettoient le sol. Et ils n'ont pas les produits qu'il faut pour travailler. Donc, c'est très difficile. Mais avec la sensibilisation que nous, les porteurs et porteuses des sans voix, qui les aident parce que pour les accéder, c'est difficile, on les sensibilise, on leur dit ce qu'il faut. Et nous, en Guinée surtout, nous faisons beaucoup la médiatisation. Nous, faisons, nous parlons dans les médias, parce que tout le monde écoute aujourd'hui. Nous utilisons les réseaux sociaux, parce que même si la personne n'a pas fait les études, mais tout le monde sait manipuler aujourd'hui le téléphone. Merci. Thanks very much, and I'm going to be really unfair to our last speaker if you can keep it as brief as possible because we're, we're running over time. And Omar, come up here while, we, while that's happening so that uh, we, can, we can move straight into the next session. So, yes, please. Thank you. In Italia, abbiamo la media di tre morti al giorno. Negli ultimi anni, abbiamo avuto anche ragazzi minori che durante il percorso scuola-lavoro sono morti nelle aziende. Abbiamo un confronto aperto, la UIL assieme alla CGL e alla CISL con il Governo. Siamo riusciti ad ottenere più assunzioni di ispettori, ma i morti sono ancora veramente tanti. Serve sicuramente più formazione, a cominciare dalle scuole dove vengono formati, istruiti, le ragazze e i ragazzi che saranno lavoratrici, imprenditori nel futuro, perché conoscano il valore della sicurezza sul lavoro, per la protezione della vita delle, per delle persone. C'è molto da fare anche sul tema della Convenzione 190, mi sono messa il foulard ricevuto nella sessione delle donne di mercoledì perché il tema della violenza e delle molestie nei luoghi di lavoro è un tema 
importantissimo che dobbiamo affrontare. In Italia abbiamo i rappresentanti dei lavoratori della sicurezza nelle aziende, ma anche quelli territoriali. Voi sapete che in Italia ci sono molte aziende piccole e allora nel territorio abbiamo rappresentanti che girano le aziende per riuscire a garantire la sicurezza sul lavoro. Ma è un lavoro immenso e molto difficile. Un'ultima cosa. La UIL ha lanciato a marzo del 2021, in piena pandemia, una campagna zero morti sul lavoro, chiedendo a cantanti, ad artisti, a tutti quelli che volevano di farsi fotografare con un nostro simbolo della campagna. Perché il tema della salute e della sicurezza sul lavoro non riguarda solo le lavoratrici e i lavoratori. Il simbolo che abbiamo identificato per questa campagna è il simbolo dell'ok, okay, perché nella guerra gli americani, quando eh, la sera mettevano nella bandiera i numeri dei morti che avevano e qualche rara volta il simbolo era zero killed. Allora chiedo a tutti voi adesso di dire che nel mondo del lavoro noi dobbiamo riuscire ad arrivare a zero killed. Vi chiedo di fare questo simbolo ora. Grazie. Great, thank you very much indeed. I asked two questions, I got 100% answers from everybody, so well done. Thank you very much to my panel. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague uh, Omar, who's going to lead the final part of this, uh, of this session. Thanks very much, Omar. Thanks very much to everyone in the thank audience you. and on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Francisco Marquez, which, who Alex had seen and then he left, but don't worry, we'll get him up on the stage because he's speaking last, so you can start. Okay, okay. okay. and the video is ready? Okay. All right, um, comrades, distinguished delegates, brothers and sisters, um, it's a pleasure to moderate part three of this Congress Forum on Global Shocks. This part of the session will focus on the multiple conflicts taking place around the world, as well as attacks on democratic institutions that are taking place, and it will showcase the critical role that our unionists can and have been playing in promoting peace and democracy. There are more than 60 wars and conflicts taking place across the world right now, as we are gathered here in Melbourne. Across the world, 25 million people have been forced to become refugees outside their home countries, and tens of millions more are displaced internally. My continent, Africa, is unfortunately all too often familiar with conflicts. We are currently seeing continuous incidents of conflict, violent extremism, terrorism across 
the continent, including the Sahel and Lake Chad Basin, region is East Africa, the Horn of Africa, Mozambique's northern province of Cabo Delgado, and in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region. Somalia, my own country, has its own heart-wrecking history of conflict. As a result of Somalia's 21 years of a military dictatorship, 30 years of civil war, and the subsequent rise of terrorism by Al-Shabaab and Daesh, many families and generations have known nothing but ongoing conflict and insecurity. According to the United Nations, at least 613 civilians have been killed and 948 injured in terror attacks in Somalia since the beginning of this year alone. Colleagues, at the heart of all of the devastating conflicts across the world is the loss of human life, the legacy of trauma, which many generations must contend with. At the heart of this is the severe in this interruption to a country's and a community's social and economic development. At the heart of this is the impact on workers who are left destitute and unable to support their families or who may under conflict situations face exploitation, uncertainty, or abuse. Whatever the circumstances, countries during and post-conflict look to workers as key players in national reconstruction, rebuilding, and economic development. Fighting for workers' rights within a country at war is no easy challenge, but it is an essential part of conflict prevention and resolution where people are deprived of the economic security of decent work, where workers' rights and other human rights are trampled, the hope and promise of peace is far from within reach. Workers and their unions are also key actors in peace and reconstruction efforts. My union, the Federation of Somali Trade Unionists, FESTU, has made peace building an essential priority. We have been participating, capacitating trade union leaders to engage effectively in conflict resolution and peace building efforts, working to institutionalize social dialogue as a tool for engagement, increased understanding, and consensus building. Just this morning, the ITUC published its Freedom Report showcasing how unionists across the world are working to promote peace and reconciliation, as well as defend and strengthen democracy. And in this forum today, we will be hearing firsthand from unionists across the world on what they are doing in this regard. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extraordinary actionists of trade union solidarity in the wake of one of the most recent conflicts the world is facing. That is none other than the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let us turn now to a short video of some of the actions unionists have been taking in this regard.
colleagues, brothers and sisters, these are inspiring scenes of support from unionists across Europe in welcoming refugees, in delivering critical supplies and aid to those in need in Ukraine, and in taking to the streets to demand a peaceful resolution to this conflict. Now, I would like to turn to my distinguished panelists, and I would like to pass the floor to Phil Jennings, whom you all know very well. One is a trade unionist, he's always a trade unionist. So he's still with us, and we, I wanted to give him the floor. He's the, now the co-chair of the International Peace Bureau and a long-standing leader within the global union movement for a keynote address where he will share with us the role he has seen trade unionists play in peace movement alliance building. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And let me first uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and I pay tribute to the leaders past, present and emerging. I am now the co-president of the world's oldest peace NGO. We were formed over 130 years ago. And when I joined this peace movement, they said to me, where do the unions stand? And I said, we are a movement for peace. And they looked at me and said, really? They said, Jennings, your movement is certainly peaceful. We would like to hear some more noise. And I realized that in this task, I had some work to do to rebuild our profile, some convincing to do, and I hope that the message that comes loud and clear from this Congress is that this movement globally, regionally, and nationally will engage with more vigor and energy to the cause of peace in this world. In my conversations with the peace movement, I say that without union work, there is no social contract and hence no peace. I say without your work in the NGO world for peace, for with no peace, there is no social contract. I remind them that the world's first social contract that brought the ILO into existence says that there is no lasting peace without social justice. I say that war anywhere is a threat to peace everywhere. And it is clear for me that we are a peace movement. And I hope you can agree with me that peace is Union business, it's our duty. Willy Brandt said that peace is not everything, but without peace, everything is nothing. And we agree with him. And I say to the world, when you look at our constitutions, the ITUC, the regional organizations, your own organizations, there is a commitment to peace and the safeguarding of peace, that we have the goal of peace in our objects is at the heart of our values. And we say that peace is not just the absence of war. It's a peace continuum of themes from human rights to democracy, social justice, and discrimination. And that in our work, that we worked actively with the NGOs and with those social movements, our history is marked for action for peace, the sacrifices for peace, losing members uh, as a result of war that we've taken action against war and disarmament and nuclear weapons for conflict resolution. And we've done it by demonstrating, by taking strike action and by boycotts and all the kinds of campaigns that we do. We know that the people are victims of war and we know that war brings economic ruin. We in the peace movement have recognized the labor movement's strong stand against the war in Ukraine we consider this invasion illegal, a breach of the UN Charter. This invasion must not succeed. And we recognize the work that unions around the world have done in the speed of their response to give humanitarian aid and assistance. We express our solidarity with the people of Ukraine, but we also express our solidarity with those peace activists in Russia who are faced with repression and arrest 
and brutality when they stand up and make their voices heard. Colleagues, thank you. Today we face the global shocks of global shocks. As the UN Secretary General said, we face breakdown or breakthrough. We are faced with colossal global dysfunction. We are on the highway to conflict hell. Why? The doomsday clock is at 100 to seconds to midnight, the closest that it has ever been. When we look at war in this world, there are 355 active conflicts taking place, 700 million women subject to violence, a wars that cost us $15 trillion a year, 10% of the world's outfit, output. We have 2 billion people living in conflict zones. We have climate change and climate refugees. 2.6 billion of our fellow citizens live in places exposed to climate hazard. There are 13,000 nuclear weapons, 3,500 ready to go, 1,800 of them within a time period of 15 minutes. Nuclear doctrines are changing. The language and the engagement of military leaders is about using nuclear weapons in the theaters of war, and that spends the end for all of us. Military expenditure, sisters and brothers, is going through the roof, two trillion and growing. 135 nations have increased their military expansion, expenditure. The guard rails for peace, for arms control and disarmament are being kicked away. It's open warfare in that sense. And finally, we have the geopolitical tensions in this world with a doctrine now of strategic competition, i.e. we will compete with our geopolitical adversaries on all points of the compass, economic, social, and military. In short, we are faced with a great global dilemma and a threat to peace in this world and also the new challenges. We have a duty as a peace movement and as a labor movement not to be found wanting in our response. It is important that we push peace and the architecture of peace up the agenda. Peace is union business. Alliance building is union business. The agenda for the future must take a new form. We must demand a new peace architecture. The UN Charter, we have. The Security Council, we have. But the institutions that have been built are no longer working. They're not preventing the conflicts that we see in this world. I ask this Congress, I ask unions everywhere to begin a new consideration about what that peace architecture looked like, to look at what the mechanisms involved and the institutions that we need to build. The time has come. In 2025, we have the 50th anniversary of the Helsinki Declaration. That, in the end, transformed not just Europe, but the world. It brought with it new institutions, which brought peace. We became too complacent. We became too complacent listening to some of the more aggressive noises out there that this could not happen. It did happen. A priority for us then must be a new consideration of conflict resolution and a new peace architecture that goes worth it. We have to raise our voices even stronger against the potential use of nuclear weapons. One of the great successes that we, working together, have brought is a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. We now have 68 ratifications, but we need to do more to stigmatize and show the humanitarian consequences. This planet cannot survive a nuclear war, and this Congress has to condemn the threat of their use. We have to look critically at military spending, which, as I said, is going through the roof. For every penny spent on a bullet, on a tank, or a plane, is a social cost in terms of social protection, social insurance, and welfare. We need to look once again at what guardrails are required. We need strategic stability talks between the USA and Russia, between the USA and China, to de-escalate the tensions that exist and to look once again at a disarmament agenda. We need to look at the cost of the victims of war. We heard yesterday from the indigenous people of Australia, but very often the first victims of war and of those nuclear attempts have been indigenous people. 
We need to examine the new threats of organized terrorism, of space, uh, the militarization of space, cyber attacks, autonomous weapons, etc. In short, we have one hell of a job on our hands. We must not be found wanting. We must engage with all our energy and our craft and our experience. A social contract is vital. A just transition is vital. Disarmament is vital. Peace education is vital. And human and union rights are vital in this process to turn back the doomsday clock. The founder of the IPB, and I say this in closing, was a wonderful woman, a Nobel Prize winner, Bertha von Suttner. And she said, as long as our hearts beat for peace, we must win over the hearts of all people for peace. My message to this Congress from the ancient IPB is that let unions everywhere, that our hearts beat for peace, that let us win over the hearts of all the people for peace. Let us unite in our efforts to change the direction of this world and to put this world on a new trajectory. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Phil Jennings, um, for that powerful uh, speech, which really underlines uh, the importance of peace and the role that unionists have been playing and should continue to be playing. Um, we are a peace movement. Peace is a union business. And like Antonio Guterres, he has quoted, he said, we are in a situation of either breakdown or breakthrough. And the important other word that I have noted is the doomsday clock is ticking. <laughs> and this is really clear message that we should forge a new social contract. Now, we will hear from Liv Torres, the International Secretary of LO Norway. Sister Torres was very much involved in the development of the four hour shared future report by the Common Security Commission, which launches a global call to action to set the world on the path to peace based on the concept of common security among the humanity, wherever they are. I would like to ask Sister Torres, can you give us an overview of the key messages of the report and why its messages are so timely now? Please. Thank you very much. Now, let me start by quoting Philip, saying we have a massive job on our hands and you will hear examples of unions engaging in peace building efforts at a national level in quite a few. Colombia will be one obvious example, but there will be others as well. Now, there's also, of course, global initiatives where the unions have engaged heavily. And the Common Security 2022 report and commission is one such example. The initiative was taken by the Palmer Center, the ITUC and the International Peace Bureau. And of course, the background is the Palmer Commission from 40 years back, which introduced which introduced the concept of common security. Now, the Palmer Commission 40 years back basically introduced this concept with the wording that security can be obtained only through cooperative undertakings. Now, of course, cooperative undertakings providing the basis for power, both power and security, is not a foreign concept for the trade union movement, but that's where we started common security. We had that 
as the background for the commission work and the report to come out. And of course, the UN Secretary General saying in the common agenda that humanity faces a stark and urgent choice, breakdown or breakthrough. And we, of course, went for breakthrough. I'll give you some of the key messages that we highlighted in the commission work and report. One was and is the strengthening of the global architecture for peace that Philip also pointed towards. We give examples of regional bodies needing to integrate common security concepts in their work, strategic stability talks between US and Russia, as well as US and China, very timely indeed for the, the setting we have around us, integrating climate-related security risks into UN conflict prevention strategies. We suggested UN peace conferences, again, very timely, we believe, and the strengthening of the international agenda for women, peace, and security. We have a second set of key messages around a new peace dividend, where we are saying we need to strengthen international law. We need to convene a special UN General Assembly for disarmament. We are pointing towards the need to reduce arms spending and spend money basically on the SDGs and peace building efforts instead. We have a third point on revitalizing the nuclear arms control and disarmament. We appeal to more countries to sign on to the nuclear arms treaty, the ban on nuclear arms. And we encourage states to, uh, to sign on to the no first use policy as yet another example. I'll mention one fourth last area of proposals which focus on the new military technology and outer space weapons. But I'd like to, to basically end up with what I think is the key concept in the whole report. We underline civil society as the watchdog and peace promoter. We are that main civil society body and organization. We are the biggest civil society organization in the world with approximately 200 million members. We are that watchdog if we want to be so. By building bottom up, organizing, building collective muscles and uniting around principles and values of peace. Now I'm gonna stretch a little bit further than the report itself and highlighting the need in this critical time to basically build unity around peace, solidarity, respect for nation states and basically appealing to all superpowers to refrain from aggression. Unity and building organizational muscles is gonna give us the power to take the messages forward that Philip pointed towards and that we highlight in the common security report that has basically been taking the messages of the international trade union movement forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liv, um, for you know, delivering us the key messages in the Common Security Report. Um, of course, you know, one of the key issues is, is security can only be attained through common undertaking. So it's a collective responsibility for all of us. And of course, strengthening global architecture of security. And uh, I can tell you that um, the African Union is promoting something called African peace and security architecture, which unionists are making a lot of noise in Africa. And um, other key important is women, peace, and security. 
that is really something that have to be underlined. Um, of course, the critical issue is we are not going to be bystanders. We are the watchdog, the civil society. The largest civil society grouping is the labor movement. So these are key issues and they are all vital for us and underline why we have to be uh, you know, involved and why peace is a union business. Now, I would like um, to focus on you know, our colleague, um, um, our different colleagues, the role that the trade unions are playing in peace, in uh, their national uh, capacities in their respective countries. I would like representatives of three unions to share their histories with regard um, to our discussions today. Yoshiko Norimatsu, I hope I am pronouncing properly, the Assistant General Secretary of Rengo Japan. Um, Rengo has been actively campaigning against the nuclear weapons that Leif just talked about, um, and the danger and the need to make sure the effective ban of the nuclear weapons. Can you explain why this is so important for Japanese workers and what is your strategy or what your strategy has been? はい、ありがとうございます。え、連合の福祉務局長の乗松義子です。え、まず今日はこのような発表の機会を与えていただいたことに感謝します。え、連合は基調とする日本国憲法の理念に沿った自由、平等、公正で平和な社会を実現することそして軍縮、核兵器の全面廃絶と国際緊張の緩和のために努力をし世界平和の実現に努めるということです第二次世界大戦中日本では原子爆弾が、によって、当時、広島で約14万人。え、長崎では約7万4000人が亡くなりました。現在でも被爆の後遺症で苦しんでいる方や、健康への不安に苛まれている2世3世の方もいます。被爆者に対する差別と戦ってきた人々の歴史もあります。え、私たちが安心して暮らし、働き、労働運動に関わるには社会が平和で安定していることが大前提であることは誰しもが疑わないところです。え、ですが、え、敗戦から77年が経過した現在、え、日本
今年の夏は参加できませんでしたが連合は2005年以来核兵器廃絶に長く取り組んできている2団体そして ITUC とも連携して NPT 再検討会議に参加していますまた核兵器廃絶1000万署名を実施し824万筆以上を集めることができました各地方連合会では毎年原爆写真ポスターを使用した原爆展を実施しています2021年1月核兵,器廃核兵器禁止条約が発効しましたこの条約の全文には核兵器使用の犠牲者被爆者の受け入れ難い苦しみと被害に留意すると明記されましたこれは被爆者が果たしてきた役割の重要性を国際社会が認めたことに他なりませんしかし残念なことに日本は本条約を批准していません連合は唯一の戦争被爆国としての役割と責任を果たすため日本国政府に対し早期の批准を強く求めています私たちには労働運動という社会,社会的資源を誰もが安全安心に暮らせる多様性に満ちた社会づくりに生かすとともに健全な民主主義を牽引していく役割があります連合はこの間も ITUC と連携して香港、ミャンマー、ウクライナの兄弟姉妹の支援そして平和を取り戻す取り組みを行ってきました連合は唯一の戦争被爆国のナショナルセンターとしてこれからも核兵器廃絶、平和の構築に向け取り組みを続けていきます皆さん、労働組合が平和構築に中心的に関与する意義と重要性を再確認しみんなで連帯して取り組み続けていきましょう I thank you very much Thank you,、uh, Yoshiko. Now I will give the floor to Francisco Maltes, President of CUT Colombia. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Un fraternal saludo de la Central Unitaria de Trabajadores de Colombia, la CUT. Nosotros apoyamos la lucha de todos los pueblos originarios por la tierra y por sus valores culturales y tradicionales. Segunda instancia, queremos decirles que en Colombia se vivió un conflicto armado durante cerca de 60 años que significó el desplazamiento de más de 10 millones de personas, más de 100 mil personas. asesinados, muertos, y han sido asesinados en medio de este conflicto más de 3.300 hombres y mujeres sindicalistas. Hemos vivido de plano y de lleno y sentido los rigores de la guerra. Pese a esto, la CUT siempre ha llamado a la solución política de los conflictos, del conflicto armado, que se vivió. Siempre enarbolamos la solución negociada y la paz como los elementos centrales de nuestra política. Tercero, eh, hoy existe un mundo diferente al de hace 10 años, al de hace 20 años. Hoy existe un mundo multipolar, hay una batalla entre las superpotencias por la supremacía mundial, por hacerse a los mercados, por hacerse a los recursos estratégicos. Y entendemos que lo que se da en Ucrania es una guerra entre las superpotencias por la supremacía mundial. Así lo vemos. Y creemos que por supuesto, este conflicto se debe resolver mediante el diálogo y la negociación. No puede el movimiento sindical eh, recoger recursos económicos para algunos de los contrincantes. Eso es incentivar, eso es motivar la guerra. Y creemos, por supuesto, que el elemento central debe ser 
el diálogo, la negociación para la solución del conflicto tal como se ha hecho en Colombia. Y eh, también consideramos, por supuesto, que ninguna organización sindical en el mundo puede ser sancionada políticamente por tener una opinión diferente en cuanto a la lectura del conflicto que se libra en Ucrania. Hoy en Colombia existe un nuevo gobierno que se logró elegir por la insistencia y la lucha del pueblo colombiano por cambiar de un gobierno. Y hoy tenemos un gobierno de centro izquierda que encabeza el compañero Gustavo Petro, que ha puesto tres elementos centrales para resolver los conflictos que hay en Colombia, que es eh, la paz total para llegar a un acuerdo con alguna fuerza insurgente que todavía existe en Colombia. Eh, segundo, para llegar a algunos acuerdos con eh, fuerzas paramilitares que todavía existen en Colombia, eh, para que al final de este proceso las armas reposen como monopolio del Estado. Y desde la CUT, por supuesto, creemos que se hace necesario, hemos definido, apoyar este proceso de paz total, de justicia social y de justicia ambiental, que son los tres pilares de la política del presidente Gustavo Petro. Y hemos eh, apoyado el tema de la política de paz total, porque creemos que eso va a incidir para que hayan más recursos para la salud, para la educación, para el pago de la deuda social que existe en Colombia y, por supuesto, eh, menos recursos para la guerra. Esa es una situación que queremos eh, dejar de presente y contar nuestra experiencia eh, en este importante evento que sobre la paz ha organizado eh, la CCI. Thank you very much, Francisco. Colleagues, these are incredible stories showing how trade union determination can foster peace and promote democratic rights and freedoms, whether it is in Japan or in Colombia or whether it is in Asia or in Latin America. Now, I would like to turn to give the last word to my sister Mariela Cohen from the TUC in Great Britain to react to what we have heard so far and to also explain how some of these messages resonate with the work that the TUC has been doing to promote peace and democracy. Thank you and um, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, it's, it's a pleasure to share the panel with, with all the other speakers and I think this event You know, it's billed as global shocks, and whether that is war, as in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, or the war in Yemen, Israel's illegal occupation in Palestine, there's also many other shocks that we're facing that I think Phil touched on, uh, the climate crisis, the, the impact of the pandemic, and the increasing threats to democracy, the rise of far-right regimes, authoritarianism, all alongside deepening inequality that many of our of our members face, and I think all these issues do interconnect. Um, I was asked specifically to talk about the role of, of unions in peace building and, and supporting democracy, and I think a lot has already been said. Um, my personal background is, is of participating in the Colombian peace negotiations first as a trade union in initiative born out of Britain and Ireland to share experiences with the Colombian negotiators and, and then Uh, directly taking part in the part in the negotiations and we at the TUC really have prioritized building a narrative around peace around a working class vision of, of what peace means and also confronting the, the the shrinking space of democracy and the rise of the far right 
And another thing that we have prioritized in all aspects of our work is this principle of sharing experiences, sharing lessons in whatever areas are useful for our domestic agenda and for, for our sister trade unions agenda. And I think it's already been said that we know that the working class is always um, the, the sector of society that most suffers in war. There's a quote by John McLean, a socialist um, trade union leader from Glasgow, Scotland, who was imprisoned for three years for his opposition to World War I. And he said, a bayonet is a weapon with a worker at both ends. So I think, as Phil already outlined, it's in our movement's interest to be at the forefront of supporting the end of conflict and to contributing to the building of peace. Um, there's different versions of the quote. I, I was gonna say peace is not just the absence of war, but the presence of justice. Um, and I would say we should add social justice um, to, that, to that quote. I think also war, as we've seen, offers opportunities to increase authoritarian practices, um, anti-union practices, uh, uh, attacks on human rights, and policies of increased military budgets and cuts in social spending only add to the, to the crisis for workers. Um, Liv already said, you know, we're part of the biggest global civil society movement in the world, and I think we have a role to play in, in peace building and our principles of internationalism, of solidarity, but also our experience of dialogue, of negotiations, are all lessons that can be incorporated into, into building peace. And there's many examples, the report that the ITC published today, and also we've heard, you know, from Rengo, from Colombia, about their direct experiences. Um, in how we can share those lessons. In Northern Ireland, for example, during the conflict, unions were at the forefront of mobilizing civil society support for the Good Friday Agreement. They were also at the forefront of using their organizational capacity to generate support across communities for the peace agreement. And they played a huge role in workplaces of trying to um, overcome some of the sectarian divides and, and build reconciliation and using the workplace as a place to, to build that rec reconciliation. And as I said, as internationalists, I think we should be sharing these lessons with, with our sisters and brothers in, in situations of conflict. In 2003, the British trade union movement founded Justice for Colombia. Later, the Irish unions got behind that campaign. And its main objective was to support Colombian trade unions um, in the defense of human rights, but also in that search for a negotiated solution to the conflict. Francisco already touched on, on the figures, you know, the, the thousands of, of dead, of forcibly disappeared, of internally displaced. And during the start of the peace talks between the Colombian government and the FARC, unions from Ireland and Britain um, invested in this initiative where we took key figures from the Good Friday Agreement negotiations to share their experiences with the Colombian negotiators from both sides. And then we also brought in South African voices, people that had taken part in the truth and reconciliation process, people that had taken part in developing the new constitution. And you know, we've seen the results. There's a truth commission in Colombia that you know, has taken the testimonies of you know, what the union movement in Colombia cause genocide of the trade union movement. And those stories and the truth about what's happened to trade unions in Colombia have been part of that peace process. We also took women who had been at the forefront of, of conflict and of peace negotiations to share the specific lessons of women in conflict and in peace building. And I think, you know, there's no conflicts that are the same, but there's lessons that are transferable, that can be adapted, that can be useful. And some of those lessons include, you know, addressing the root causes of a conflict in negotiations, laying out ways to build a sustainable peace, the need to build trust between parties, the need to de-escalate, to recognize there's no winners, there's no losers in a, in a peace agreement. Um, and primarily, and, and I think what's most relevant to us, the need to have inclusive peace processes where trade unions are involved, marginalized groups are involved, um, employers, churches, and I think South Africa, you know, offers a really important lesson in civic participation in, in building peace. I also just wanted to, to say that I think, and I think it's something we know, because many of our comrades have experienced it firsthand, that there are always attempts at silencing voices who call for peace at moments of, of war and in really difficult moments when people are obviously facing the horrors and tragedy of war. And we saw it in Colombia, many, Many of our friends, you know, who called for peace at the time when peace talks weren't popular, when it wasn't easy to call for that, 
were accused of being terrorists, were, you know, assassinated, were imprisoned. And we know that truth is often the first victim of war and polarization and disinformation abounds in moments of war. So I think we also need to confront the rhetoric of war to de-escalate language as well as call for de-escalation of, of the military conflict and contribute to building a narrative that, that generates support for peace negotiations. Um, I think we you know, have a key role to call for ceasefires, to call for, for negotiations and to call for international law to be respected without inconsistencies, without hypocrisy, to call for multilateralism and, and to support this idea of common security that Liv and others have, have referenced and, and, and worked on so hard to, to push this idea that this is responsibility of the entire international community and it's something that belongs to the international community. So just to end, um, I just want to re-emphasize that point. I think we have a wealth of collective experiences around the world, and it's not just the countries that are on the table or that have been mentioned. There's many, many lessons in this room itself uh, that I think we can, we can build on, and despite political differences, actually build a united collective voice on those principles and contribute not just as bystanders but as active participants in building a vision of peace and a reality of peace on the ground with social justice. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Mariela. I, um, yeah, and it's very clear, Mariela has underlined the role of the unions uh, in peace building and conflict resolution, especially um, the role that the TUC has played in the peace process in Colombia. Um, the Friday Agreement, and you know the negotiation is on for peace negotiations, the ceasefire, and lastly underlining, you know that the collective experience that trade unions have, in terms of promoting peace and the stability, uh, is unmatched, and there is a need for united and collective voice to speak within the labor movement uh, to promote the peace. Um, colleagues, we are being pressed by time. Um, I want to see if I can give the floor um, to colleagues uh, um, to speak. And uh, yeah, okay. Um, I will give one person, and that will be Salvatore. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, comrade. Uh, grazie, Omar. Uh, continuo in italiano. Eravamo insieme a Mogadiscio e parlavamo di processo di pace nel corno d'Africa, nel momento in cui ancora non c'era la guerra in Tigray, non c'era la guerra in Ucraina, insieme come organizzazioni italiane, insieme alle organizzazioni del corno d'Africa, per dire che la pace non è qualcosa che va promosso nel momento in cui c'è la guerra, come ha detto proprio uh, Mariella pochi minuti fa, ma la pace è un valore assoluto che il sindacato deve continuare a promuovere sempre nel suo lavoro quotidiano di rappresentanza collettiva. Ed è in questo spirito che proprio alcuni giorni fa, a novembre, il 5 di novembre per essere precisi, le organizzazioni italiane insieme a tantissima parte della società civile, hanno detto cessate il fuoco. In Ucraina siamo con i pacifisti, in Ucraina, in Bielorussia, in Russia, e vogliamo chiedere anche attraverso questa piattaforma che le Nazioni Unite convochino urgentemente una assemblea mondiale per la pace in tutto il mondo, come valore assoluto e come base di lancio per quello che è quello che vogliamo chiedere in questi giorni qui a Melbourne come sindacato mondiale, ovvero lavoro dignitoso, perché senza pace non ci può essere lavoro dignitoso. Mi fermo qua perché il tempo è pochissimo. Grazie. Thank you very much, brother Salvatore. Um, please. Merci. Monsieur le Président Moderateur, mon nom est Malik Si, je suis de la Confédération Nationale des Travailleurs du Sénégal. Je voudrais dans un premier temps signaler toute la pertinence de ce sous-thème, promotion de la paix, promotion de la démocratie, parce que ça nous rappelle 
la mission historique et fondamentale du mouvement syndical, qui est de travailler de manière durable pour la paix et la démocratie. Parce que sans la paix, la démocratie, il n'y a pas de travail. Et c'est les travailleurs qui en subissent principalement les conséquences, pas les capitalistes qui ont amassé assez d'argent pour vivre un certain temps. Première considération. Deuxième considération, ce que les syndicats font ou ont fait. Information. Les 5 et 6 septembre 2022, à Dakar, il a été convoqué un atelier international de 17 organisations africaines, francophones, anglophones, et ils ont sorti une résolution sur l'insécurité en Afrique. Dans les constats, on a montré les conséquences que ça a au niveau des populations, principalement au niveau des travailleurs, et on a lancé dans cette résolution un appel à la solidarité, à la mobilisation et à l'action, aussi bien au niveau du mouvement syndical qu'au niveau des États. Donc ça, c'est un exemple de ce que les syndicats ont fait. Alerte à la solidarité, alerte, mobilisation, travail. Je pense que ça aussi, c'est une illustration, une information qu'on donne à l'Assemblée. De, dernier point, je pense que lorsqu'on parle des leçons syndicales, des chocs mondiaux, je travaille principalement au niveau de la CNT sur les questions de migration. Il est vrai que dans la déclaration ou dans le projet de déclaration, la question de la migration a été posée euh, sur les, au niveau des droits humains, au niveau de l'égalité, page 36 ou 47. Mais je pense que la question de la migration aussi a une place dans l'appréciation sur les chocs mondiaux. Parce que de notre point de vue, aujourd'hui, la question de la migration structure toutes les contradictions de notre époque. Même si c'est signalé ailleurs, je pense que ça a sa place ici. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Um, delegates, brothers and sisters, it is now time to close this Global Shockies Forum. But I would like to thank all of you for your participation. It was very rich discussion, especially our distinguished panelists and colleagues who have contributed from the floor. You have shown that without doubt, our unionists can help me cultivate an environment of tolerance, dialogue, that can put the world on the path of peace, and we have to play our own role. Thank you very much, colleagues.